Hello and welcome to podcast number 63. 63? I'm Gary. And I'm Ian. And today we're going to be catching up on the recent film and TV news. We're going to be catching up on TV films and games that we've played. Yeah. And we're actually not going to have a second part of the podcast today. No theme. No theme, that being said, but we will have a Q&A after the news. Yes. How are you doing, Ian? Uh, I'm not doing too bad. I mean, it's actually been like four weeks since the last podcast. Yeah, it doesn't well, feel we, too far again, it, does it? Like, too long ago. Yeah, it's not been too short or anything, is it? I mean, fucking hell, January just came and went. We did actually delay a week, though, because things just got too busy anyway. Well, yeah, yeah, and we had to just push things aside. But, yeah, like, after the last podcast, I mean, like I said, we shot, uh, me and Andy, we had to shoot off home. Like, he had something to do, and I was... The rumble? Yeah, well, yeah, he was <laughs> off to do the rumble, but I, I, I was getting a lift from him, so it was a choice between walking home, which is really far from here, from where Gary lives, or, you know, getting a lift. So I was just like, Gary, I've got to go. Here you go. Here's the end of the podcast. And then the idea just flowed from there. I was like, right, next podcast, we will definitely get all the answers, uh, the questions and answers and get that together and throw that together. And then find out from Andy that he's just been massively snowed in under work. So that's why he's not here for this podcast. It was just like, fucking hell, you know, like... I'm back to work. You're back to work. We're getting back onto the stream. It never ends here at off, off the shelf reviews. Does it doesn't it? really. Right. No. It really doesn't. We look forward to summer. We go, hey, summer's coming. Don't work the fucking film in. Oh, well, that'll get us ready for Halloween. And Halloween just fucking blows out the water. Um, what have I done recently? Well, like I said, I went back to work. Um, editing. Uh, I did get the Tomb Raider trilogy remastered. Nice, for yeah, the that's Switch. Tomb Raider one, two, and three. Tomb Raider right? one, two, and three. I bought that for Valentine's Day uh, for me and the wife because she's a bit of a Tomb Raider fan. And I've been wanting to play Tomb Raider two since like February last year. <laughs> that's very specific. <laughs> well, yeah, it was because kind of last year I like I was going through this phase of wanting to pick up uh, classic PlayStation one games. And yeah. put in my collection games that you know you rented but you didn't actually own at the time and then before you know it the next console came along so it went out the window and one of them like I bought Resident Evil 2 I bought Code Veronica I really really Classics. wanted to get Silent Hill and I got a story about that one um, but one of the games I was like man I really want to play Tomb Raider 2 Tomb Raider 1 oh it's great Tomb Raider 2 you know that's where it at it's got the boat the Venice level the underwater shit it was um, those underwater levels that stopped me from ever finishing my oh, game. Yeah. Man, <laughs> the game was fucking hard. Yes. And then when they announced they were making a remaster, I'm like, I need to get it. And I'm so glad I did because you can save anywhere. Nice. In the okay, well, oh, wow. Yeah. Anywhere. So me and the wife, oh, me and Linda were playing it together. And every now and again, she's like, save. I'm like, yep, thank you. you forget that you get <laughs> the option now. <laughs> you forget to do that. And then when you die, you realize you've got to go back and do shit so we smashed out tomb raider one that was like 10 levels nice yeah it's not actually a very long game it's the first not one. a long yeah. game and some of the puzzles are really quite easy we're all, we're in kind of the middle ground of tomb raider 2 because like i said that was the one i wanted to do uh tomb raider 3 i've told her she's playing no fan no um i i want to see it all the way through and i'll watch her play it but i'm smashing out tomb raider 2 so i think it's only fair that she should smash out tomb raider 3 that's fair on enough, her yes. own yeah um like i said getting back to my silent hill story so silent hill i don't know if anybody's seen it silent hill 1 for the playstation the actual case game and all that's very rare now it's getting up to at least 100 quid to buy in a good condition if you can get it in a good condition it's at least worth 100 quid and all last year, I kept seeing ones for 60 and 70, and I kept thinking about buying it, but then other things kept So those were bargains. Why didn't you get them then? Because I, <laughs> I had other things. I was, I was fucking trying to buy Resident Evil 2 oh, and fair. Resident Evil Code Veronica and stuff like that. And, you know, dishing out 60, 70 quid for a PlayStation 1 game. Right. You know, that's like a commitment. Um, and then uh, last month, I decided I'd seen one for eighty pounds. Okay, where to? Uh, CEX. Okay, okay. There was one for eighty without the manual, and then there was one for ninety with the manual. And I was like, "Oh man, ten pound for a Silent like, Hill one like, manual." It's, it's it. <laughs> like if you want to get it, like after a while, I kept thinking ninety quid for that game. That's an investment. There's a high chance it's, that that it's game a, is a treasure. Will yeah. either get more expensive in the future, or it will crash and burn. Either way, I've bought it. It's in my collection. I've actually got a copy of Silent Hill, um, and then it got sold out. Oh, because <laughs> <laughs> as I was waiting to get paid and I was working out all my money, I was like, right, I need ninety quid aside to fucking buy a PlayStation One game. 
and I got sold out. And then I was talking to our friend Phoenix Shroud, um, you know, part of the off the chauffeurs. And he's a bit like I said, I think I said last podcast, he's a bit of a whiz with a oh, good old eBay. Right. You know, he's always finding the best deals. He's always getting like things sent to him to say, oh, you might be interested in this. And so while I was at work, he helped me look for a nice copy on uh, eBay. Cool. And I managed to get a copy for 75 quid. Oh. We put in a deal for 70 quid. Well, he put in the deal for me for 70 quid. And it was confirmed and there was some post and packaging. Now, the weirdest thing was it had to be sent. Now, that's where I got really nervous. Right. Because the, guy, the seller said it was in perfect condition. Royal Mail don't know shit. They don't know what they're delivering. They don't know what they're delivering. They could be throwing this shit around in the back of a fucking truck for all I know, smashing up the case and stuff like that. It could turn up. It might just be an empty case. You know, I've just spent 70 quid on an empty case. I don't know. So I was all nervous. spent 10 quid saying. on just a manual earlier, almost. <laughs> I know, I know. I know. Man, this thing turned up with the manual. It was so good reading through the book. I was like, oh, they don't do manuals no more. Pretty much. Yeah, it's true. Um, though, so Phoenix Travel was keeping in contact. Look, it should be delivered today. It's being tracked, blah, blah, blah. And I... I, I got a message from him saying, actually, the guy says it's not being sent today. He's going to send it in a couple of days because he's been ill. I was like, oh, really upset. Yeah. I had, you know, I wanted to play it. I kept kept listening to the music, the intro music over and over again. I was just like, stop teasing yourself. <laughs> and then one day, the day it turned up, it was misty as... Oh, yes, I looked out the. I looked out my work window, and normally I can see like just waiting the for miles. the foghorn to go off, the siren, the siren, I'm <laughs> the, like, the road to just disappear in front of you. I'm looking at this mist in front of me. I'm like, oh, this is. And a then really the good sign. Hill postman from homecoming <laughs> yeah, turns up. Yeah. You're like, no. <laughs> I got home from work that day. Package for you. And and it was there, and I unwrapped it, and I I was just like, gone and got my PS2, and I slapped the PS2 up, <laughs> and I slipped their game in. Man, just when that intro music hit. Oh, it's good, oh, yeah. And I'm watching the intro stuff like that, and I'm just like, man, I've saved it. I haven't played it anymore, because obviously I've got, got too scared. I've got games <laughs> coming out of my ass. Yeah, I got a bit scared. <laughs> I did the cafe bit, spoke yeah. to Sybil, uh, killed the creature, and I saved it right there. And I'm like... You should right at the start, ready I, to go now. My plan is to do three runs. Okay, you want to get all the endings. Well, no, I want to well, I want to get uh, uh, the good ending. Yeah. I need to get the alien UFO ending. <laughs> yeah. And then as soon as I've got the super hyper blaster, it's just going to be just a fun play for I'm just yeah, going to yeah. fun play through and blast everything. Nice. Um, on the subject of chauffeurs, I do want to give a shout out. Sorry, I've got to get oh. this guy's name. Um, John Winston, 1499, who commented on our last podcast. Uh, we've had a couple of messages from this guy who has um, given us some donations, given us a lot of films to review. Um, and he's going through a bit of a hard time at the moment. I, I don't think I should go into it because obviously I don't want to go into personal details for this guy, but I do want to give him a shout out and a fist bump and tell him how much we really, really appreciate his support, how much we appreciate all your support, but you know, especially his, um, and just like, we hope that he does get better and we hope everything goes well and you know, just keep watching the reviews, man. You know, that was hell yeah, sweet. hell yeah. Um, also, a big shout out to our, our boy Jay, um, who got me this sweet. Uh, obviously, if you're listening to the podcast, you can't see it, but if you're watching <laughs> it live, uh, this sweet Don the Dragon Wilson t shirt. Who dat? Who dat? <laughs> Who's Don the Dragon Wilson? I hear you <laughs> cry. Well, not just one of the funniest, greatest. Low budget B movie eighties <laughs> movie star. He's a he's a he's a high prized uh, kickboxer. I believe yeah. he is. Um, and he's won many matches in his time. And he went on into films. And he did the Blood Fist series. And here off the shelf reviews, um, I especially am a massive fan of the Blood Fist series because there were like eight movies <laughs> of varying quality. Of varying quality. <laughs> the first two are kind of like Kickboxer, and then there's one set in a prison, and then there's one where he, they, he's like Steven Seagal and he has to infiltrate an <laughs> army base which has been taken over by terrorists. They're, they're all Blood Fist movies, but none of them are actually sequels. No. They're all standalone movies. No, I think one of them is a sequel, isn't it? The, the second one is the sequel yeah. to the first one. Yeah. 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 Um, and then Don Don Wilson just plays different characters. But I did come up... I have to find it. I came up with it on the Discord year, uh, years ago, about six or seven months ago. A whole kind of theory about how they are all related. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know? And we just, Don Wilson just doesn't realise it. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> just keeps making movies and the studio goes, we'll call it Blood Fist 7. Yes. It's like, ah. Oh. <laughs> um, last thing before, obviously, I chuck it to Gary, I do want to throw out that um, if you've been up with the Twitch streams, uh, Gary may have mentioned that we watched Army of Darkness on the big screen. Um, a place where I work uh, has a cinema and I'm allowed to use it because I'm a member of staff. And uh, it's so goddamn sweet sitting in the cinema with nobody else. <laughs> it's your <laughs> dream, isn't it? My dream? Come on, tell me you did not enjoy sitting there oh. with nobody. I mean, I, I enjoyed it too, but I, I because it was a film, I guess I'd seen many times, it was great to just finally see it on the big screen. Yeah, Army of Darkness, yeah. you know, Evil Dead 3. Uh, but I, I mean, I love the cinema. I love being in an empty cinema and I love being in a packed cinema uh, yeah, because it depends yeah, on the yeah. film. You sometimes want to feed off the vibe and the energy of everyone that you're having this kind of shared experience with. Um, so, yeah. No, I don't want to share no experiences with yeah, anybody. Yeah, no, but all yours have, have been bad. Like, <laughs> really bad. Well, no, no, no. I, the, the films were great. The, yeah. The people were I know, that's bad. what I mean, yeah. And yeah. I just, I'm just not doing that anymore so that's fair. like i watched yeah. star yeah. wars on the big screen oh, i've never i mean if i had got the chance to see star wars in a normal cinema i i'd go but a lot of the times i'm just really really busy yeah this just yeah. coincides that i work there so i have the time to do it i mean i've got i've got so many films uh, practically every film i own i want to watch on big screen nice yeah 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 i think i said to you didn't i remember I? the first time when i was uh, working as a technician and i basically borrowed the projector oh yeah so we could do four player halo split yeah. screen on the wall that was you good. know and just watch whatever movies we wanted um but yeah like whenever you've got an opportunity to have just the bigger you know. the better <laughs> bigger the better i mean Pretty even much. even films i i would never think of like mm -hmm. like obviously army of darkness and star wars was great i want to watch starship troops on it i really have a massive urge to watch mortal kombat on it <laughs> wow like... mortal kombat not the newest one because that one sucks dick i mean it'd be great just for the soundtrack right? yeah, just make I... sure you crank up the volume like, on that one giant giant christopher lambert head going <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> for the memes <laughs> yes. for the memes all for the memes uh. <laughs> so have you been watching up uh, to um, I, I literally was struggling when I was coming up with my catch up. I was like, I haven't really, it doesn't feel like I've watched that much, but, um, one of the first things I want to bring up and I know it's going to sound very, very strange, oh. but cause it's, cause it's coming from me. I want to bring up wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. <laughs> I watched the Royal Rumble. You did. It was this thing, uh, you know, where lots of people go in the ring and when they get thrown over the top, they're out. Okay, don't have to make it so simplistic, man. You know, it's like a massive, huge event that's been going on for almost yeah, I mean, 30 it's, years. It's, as a, as a non-sort of somebody who doesn't really watch wrestling anymore, I usually tune in yeah. for the Rumble and for WrestleMania. It's like, I, I, it's me testing the wars to go, is there any wrestlers that I want to follow? What's the stories like? What's the show like? Yeah, What's yeah. gone on? Is there anybody left in that company that I remember <laughs> that I used to like watching? Uh, the answer was no. <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> You know, one of one of the things I did want to say was that I, I did uh, I did enjoy the event to a degree. Mm. Uh, the uh, the highlight for me was actually the women's uh, Royal Rumble. It was really good. I thought yeah. that was really good. Yeah, it was really good. Uh, my my standouts were Bianca Belair, yeah, uh, and Jordan Grace, mm -hmm. and Becky Lynch, and also Jade Cargill. Yeah, uh, I thought those were actually the the standouts. Uh, the Roman Reigns. See, this is the champion. I used to think this guy was pretty good. This was like four years ago. <laughs> Like just before he became champion, I was like, "This guy, he's, he's pretty good." And then I didn't really, didn't really follow. No, uh, he, but I, that title match I thought was really bad. Like Roman Reigns, I think when you were watching him, he was the he was a face then. Yes. You know, and a face, yeah, a face is a good guy. <clears throat> and everyone was booing him though. That was yeah, a weird. Yeah, well, everybody was booing like, oh. him because they they hated the fact that he was trying to be like a John Cena, which he wasn't. It was just the fans trying to kind of dictate, I suppose, what they thought. Yeah. Vince McMahon should be doing. Um, he's now a heel, and yes. he's running one of the biggest. I, I've noticed he had the tribal chief. Yeah, and the villain else. factions up there. He yeah. is. He is, is it on the a... brood or the no the bloodline. The, the bloodline. That's right. Yeah. And, and I'll agree. After coming off the back of the women's Royal Rumble, which was absolutely outstanding, seeing them you know pull off this event. Yeah. Um, the title match. Yeah, felt a bit watered down. It felt staged and predictable as well. Like, it, even though I haven't watched wrestling in ages, I was like, this is just following the beats of the pattern. Yeah, it, it was. Um, you know, because in a way, as a, as a follower, I know 
not that I know, but you know, you predict that Roman Reigns is going to WrestleMania. He has to defend his title yeah, at, at, the, big at the big event. Yeah, yeah. So this match that they're having is just to fill that spot. But then saying that, I like I'm looking at your little your, your rating number there. Saying that the guys did pull off a good match. Nobody got hurt. Nobody got injured. Nobody botched. Yeah. You know, they pretty much. It, it, so they did the minimum for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then uh, the way I like to imagine it is you look at the same match and you imagine it how it would look in computer graphics and you're playing it at home. You know, that's how that match should play out. You know, they, right. they hit their marks, the crowd cheers and, and, and ends happy. Basically, yeah, yeah. You know? But um, the uh, Kevin Owens and Logan Paul match, I skipped that <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for the men's rumble, I think the guy... Uh, the one character, character, one wrestler I written down actually, the one that stood out the most for me was um, Bobby Lashley. Yeah. Uh, and then you mentioned to me before, like he was a champion at one point. Yeah, yeah. He was, I was like, man, he's got the, the the build, uh, the athleticism. Uh, he, he struck an intimidating uh, presence. Yeah. And of course, I thought uh, Cody Rhodes as well. I thought was uh, was really really good. Yeah. And uh, so, and then of course all the controversy that's gone on behind or. Is it part of the storyline? Is it part, yeah. not part of the storyline? Rock's returned. Well, well, I mean, we'd been predicting the Rock's return for almost a year now. Was that because his Hollywood career has kind of not been as strong? C- kind of, but also because because of the whole Roman Reigns tribal chief thing mm-hmm. and his relation to uh, Dwayne Johnson, the Rock, in their family. How, as a wrestling fan, you look at storylines, you're like, who would I put him up against? I put him up against The Rock. The Rock comes back and says, you may be the tribal chief, but I'm The Rock. Let's fight. We're family. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. That's how that would play out. But I think The Rock had been putting, putting it off for a long time. Okay. Um, because of his um, his business outside of the ring. You know, he wants Dwayne Johnson wants to build up his name, same as Cody Rhodes did, so that when he comes back, he can say, ah, ah you don't dictate to me how much I'm being paid. I tell you, yeah, because I'm the big megastar that you need. Funnily enough, this whole Vince McMahon controversy that we we kind of delved into on the last podcast, that's all that's all disappeared. Nobody's talking about that. You can't find anything. That's all behind closed doors at the moment. They haven't gone the court. There's there's no reports of money being actually sent to anybody or what's happened. All focus is now on The Rock, Roman Reigns. Cody. Well, it's nice to have another controversy to uh, hush hush another controversy. <laughs> well, I th- I think it works in favor because um, as Vince has been taken out of the picture now, which I never thought would ever happen, but I actually I always thought would be the best step for WWE. Fair. Yeah, yeah. Is that Triple H, Paul Levesque, somebody that Gary might remember? S Triple H. <laughs> he is now fully in charge. Okay. He is in- of creative. Everything. Okay. The buck stops with him. Interesting. I yes. didn't know it was that, it was that high up. Yeah, that, that, that's how high up he is. Because, I mean, I don't want to go too far into it because we're still on, on it, but Stephanie's not there anymore. Right, yeah. Shane's, Shane's not. Shane's not there anymore. Vince isn't there anymore. Um, and so Triple H is like the the last kind of lineage of, of what we know. Of as, the McMahons. Of the, yeah, of <laughs> no. what we know of wrestling, of the history of wrestling. Yeah. The Rock is on the yeah. chairboard of Endeavor, yeah. their little group as well. So you've got Triple H and The Rock in charge Management. of one of the <laughs> biggest fucking wrestling companies. Two guys who I know personally would have the expertise, the yeah. knowledge, the ring knowledge. And the passion for it The as passion well, yeah. for it. They, they, nobody's going to push them around. Yeah. Nobody's going to question them. They're not going to put them into any stupid positions. They're not going to want them to do anything stupid. They just want one good night after another for the fans mm-hmm. to keep that business going and cool. so yeah. at the moment while we're recording this it's the fucking elimination chamber so no spoilers please oh well because um, i haven't watched <laughs> it yet but they've just pulled that off in australia oh right so uh, it's actually already happened it's already happened but i reckon they've just made a sh- shit ton of money yeah and that's gonna prep them all the way to wrestlemania nice very good when's wrestlemania april i want to say april 4th okay so it's not um, too far away. No, mate. No, mate. Well, I mean, I know it's unusual, but I want to bring up even more wrestling. Woohoo! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, one of the few films I've actually managed to see, one of the new films uh, that I've managed to see uh, to talk about for the podcast is The Iron Claw. Hell yeah. yeah. Uh, now, this is the true story of the inseparable Von Erich Brothers 
uh, who made history in the intensely competitive world of professional wrestling mm-hmm. in the early 80s. Um, though through tragedy and triumph under the shadow of their domineering father and coach, the brothers seek larger-than-life immortality on the biggest stage in sports. And uh, Now, this film was written and directed by Sean Durkin. Uh, I actually had a quick look at his uh, resume, his mm. IMDb page. I didn't recognize anything that he had produced, written, or directed wow, okay. before this, so yeah. it was a complete unknown to me. Uh, however, most of the cast I was familiar with. It stars Zac Efron uh, as Kevin, uh, Jeremy Allen White as Kerry, mm-hmm. uh, Harris Dickinson as David, Stanley Simmons as Mike, and Holt uh, McCallany as Fritz, and Maura Tierney as Doris von Eric. That was the entire von Eric family. Yeah. Uh, this was probably the best film I've seen this year so far. It, it's it's absolutely going to be a contender, I think, for my, my year's end yeah. of highlights of this year. <clears throat> this was a very well done biopic that covered just the the sort of a five year period of the family. Mm-hmm. Uh, it had like a beginning, which was the early days of the family up until the pivotal moment. And uh, and it's a film that I don't want to spoil for anyone that, that might not be aware of it. You do not need to be a fan of wrestling no, to no, enjoy yeah. this no, film. No. If you like biopics, if you like dramas, if you like uh, real stories being told yeah. in a very truthful, honest, raw way with some fantastic actors... This is a film that I can I can highly recommend to you. Yeah. Uh, and if you are a fan of wrestling and you know the legacy of the Von Erichs and oh. the tragedy that struck the family, uh, you know, pre- pre- prepare yourself. Yeah. Uh, to see yeah. this dramatization, uh, it's gonna uh, it's gonna yeah it's gonna hurt. Yeah. And it's because the the film does such a good job telling the story and the cast themselves. And of course, if you're a fan of wrestling, you get to see some good old wrestling as well. And I have to say, like the actor that they cast to play Ric Flair, yeah, yeah it was pretty good. <laughs> See, that's that's what I love about this, because obviously this is what I always say, uh, what I'm always trying to uh, convey when I'm talking about wrestling. It's like, like you watched the film. Yeah, you you've you never really watched any Von Eric matches. You've probably seen a few of them wrestle, but briefly in WWE when they were when you were younger. So on old videotapes, and then they're on highlight reels and stuff like yeah. that. And I'm like, who are they? They're not around anymore. Exactly. So and and like you said, you haven't watched it for you haven't watched wrestling really for for about for twenty years. years for now, about yeah. twenty years. All of a sudden, this film comes along, but it still hits you. The film hits you with the same passion emotion and electricity as if you were at those wrestling events oh yeah as if you were w- with those brothers and and i think that that's the beauty i always find with wrestling is that they're real people so when people go oh yeah wrestling's fake that's like you're telling the person to their face that not only are they fake but what they love and enjoy and do you know for themselves they're wrong for doing that. And so that's why I'm like, half the time, it's like, wrestler, you, you're you going to get slapped in the face yeah. for even talking that shit. I have been wanting to watch The Iron Claw for so fucking long. Since they I, announced it. Since they like, announced it. It feels like a year ago. You know, yeah, because because there's there's one pivotal point, I, like because I wikied the Von Erichs a couple of years ago, and there was one pivotal point, I won't spoil it, uh, that happens to the family that I was just like, oh, my, in my mind, when I imagined it, I was like, oh my God, that's fucking heartbreaking. Yep. Then to find out that they're making a film and then in my mind then trying to work out how they would uh, put that situation visual for the audience to watch. I'm like, it doesn't matter if you're a wrestling fan or not. That is going to break your heart yeah. when you see that bit. I won't tell you, so that's why I challenge you. I've always loved the Texas Tornado. I sure. love this tornado. I think that was I think that was Kerry Von Eric yeah. when, when he went to WWE when I was younger. I saw the Texas <clears> tornado <throat> and I thought, man, he I that could, that was my guy. Everyone likes Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan and Bret Hart. I like the Texas tornado. I think he's cool. And then he was gone. I didn't understand why. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And it wasn't until I was older. I think Jeremy Allen White is the guy from The Bear. That's right. Yeah, and he, uh, phenomenal actor. He is. Yeah, absolutely <clears> phenomenal. <throat> he Him is. is Say what you want about Zac, Zac Efron as well. Yeah, he's done I, a I was couple surprised. of high school musicals. I was very surprised. I was like, you know what, Zac Efron, you are, you've taken me away on this this journey. I really believe you are I mean, a Von Eric. Wasn't you know? he Dharma? Was was um, Zac Efron Dharma? He was a serial killer, wasn't he, in um, in one documentary? I don't I recall. can't remember what it was. It was either Dharma or... I don't think it was Dharma, no. It was the he, other... What? Yeah, I'm sorry. It's yeah. definitely one of them. But <laughs> I just remember seeing him in that and thinking... Mm. I'm just thinking of Evan Peters. I'm like, it's not him. Yeah. So. <laughs> you know, oh, wow, this guy can actually properly act. He's yeah. actually putting his heart out there to say, like, he wants to 
get better and yeah. better. So then starring him in this um, with all their story. Oh, yeah. Watch yeah. it. So, yeah, highly recommend uh, Iron Claw. If you get a chance to see it, check this one out. Yeah. Um, now, I also want to bring up, there's something I brought up last podcast. I'm probably going to bring this up until the, the series finishes its run. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Masters of the Air. Uh, it was a show I was hyped when they announced it. I've been hyped for every single episode so far. And I think it was episode four that I needed to take a time out mm. after that episode finished. Because I felt shell-shocked. Like it was almost an hour of the, some of the most intense... Uh, 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 one of the most intense experiences I've had watching a TV show. Being in the cockpit. Being Ooh, in the gunnery yeah. seat. Being in the bomber seat on those bomber planes over Germany, uh, when all the, the flat cannons are hitting them, when the enemy aircraft is shooting them down, when they when the power goes out to the engines and they know they're going to crash somewhere, they're trying to get out of the plane. Just It was relentless. Mm-hmm. And the sound effects, the visuals, the performances, are absolutely amazing. The last two episodes have been a little bit quieter. Uh, but granted, like uh, like 75% of the cast are, are not around anymore because... <laughs> Well, it was pretty brutal. Yeah. Uh, and now it's following those that have ended up ditching their planes, shot out of the sky and, you know, uh, behind enemy lines, so mm. to speak. Uh, but it's still incredibly gripping, very well, uh, very well made. And uh, a relief, actually, because I, I always thought the Pacific, which was, you know, the one after Band of Brothers, yeah. wasn't as good. It never reached the highs of Band of Brothers. It didn't even come close, I felt. Uh, whereas this one, it's it's absolutely hitting all those notes, and it'd be one of those shows that I think almost annually, every couple of years, to be a, an easy rewatch, yeah. especially if you like history, World War history, uh, and when it's made really, really well. Nice. Now, um, there's another war series that I've also been watching. Oh yeah. And I don't know why, like, because the first season was so bad, <laughs> I just I couldn't believe that I'm back for round two. I, and I'm I talking can. about Halo. Season two. You're a sucker for punishment. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, well, I mean, Halo 1 was so bad. Like, I'm, I'm, I don't think anyone that, that read the books or played the games is stuck around. If you have, you well, you're probably like me. Because I played all the games. I didn't read the books, but I'm kind of aware of the lore. I liked Master Chief and uh, well enough. Um, but I, I don't really play the games like that anymore. But, yeah. um, but I, I like sci-fi. And I like the spectacle of sci-fi. I like Master Chief and the whole world that Bungie... Uh, created it's mm-hmm. it's compelling it's great sci-fi and it rips so much from aliens you know yeah the drop ships the, yeah. the, the, the vehicles the, the armor the, the, the marines flood. the flood it, it's it's great stuff and halo season one just i mean master chief takes his helmet off right away the actor that they've got playing fucking he doesn't master chief he does not look what i imagine <laughs> the master chief looks i mean like. the suit looks great it looks like yeah, master chief it looks like a spartan great. the guy looks like the guy looks like they tried to go Jack Reacher with him, but they couldn't get a good enough Jack Reacher, so they just went with. Wish I mean, yeah, Jack they Reacher. went for a really tall guy. Yeah, you know, he's really well built. Um, but they're like, no, we need him to have a performance. We've got all this drama. We've got to have it played. We've got a love interest, and and we've got this character and that character, and all these characters that are not in the games or the books or the stories in any which way. And it just was just it was it bogged everything down. Yeah. So we only really got a good a couple of good action sequences. And you know, like by the end of the first season of Halo, like we haven't even gotten to a Halo. No, no. <laughs> Reach hasn't even fallen yet. You know, and uh, so now season two comes along, and new showrunner, new writers, and oh, first yeah. episode, I was like, okay, great action scene. It was a great action scene. Then episode two, then episode three, and I'm like, this is this is bad again. Did, it's did, just crashing really hard. Did you see the bit? I mean, spoilers, but I don't think you care because the show sucks um did you see the bit where master chief because i saw a clip where master chief tells cortana to shut up kind of yeah yeah, yeah. i was like I, I saw this bit i was like nope i said <laughs> no i'm not watching this shit because he like when i played halo uh you know and we went through all three games and uh, you know before he was lost like i kind of gave up when he went through the portal um and he was lost on the infinite and then they were going to try and bring him back or yeah. something um, I, I, I left after that but it was the whole relationship between Master Chief and Cortana Cortana was an important piece of the entire Halo franchise oh yeah and the Master Chief I mean duty, she still is well yeah yeah, yeah she, she should be that's the main crux but 
you know, Master Chief's duty was to protect her. And so over the course of the games, they grew and built this relationship because neither of them were really human and neither of them could really love. But he protected her. She protected him like brother and sister, father and daughter, loving ones kind of things. I saw that one clip. I was like, don't get it. I'm not getting that from him. Yeah. I'm, getting, I'm getting from him that she's like a burden. Oh, yeah. He resented in the first season. He resents having Cortana in there because he feels like he doesn't need her. We don't need him. <laughs> we don't need that guy. Oh, we need a master chief. <laughs> Anybody could be the master chief. You don't need to take them. You could have had a. You could have had a woman play fucking master. A tall woman play master chief. You wouldn't know because it's just the fucking suit. Yeah, but the this suit needs to take its helmet off and and act. And, no, no, and, it doesn't act. No, it doesn't. Yeah, well, that's what this show is doing. Oh, it does. And that's why it has well, well, failed. And that's why the fans that's had such a backlash. And so yeah, it has been very painful to get through. And that being said, the set design. The music, the effects are top tier. They're fantastic. Uh, I will say, this is the one thing I want to get to, is that mm. the most recent episode, episode four, season two of Halo, has delivered the best episode of its entire run so far. Okay. It was war from start to finish as we, as the aliens, the Covenant, have invaded Reach. We're seeing all of, we're seeing Wraith tanks, we're seeing dropships, we're seeing plasma, we're seeing marines fighting. <laughs> you say plasma. Plasma. <laughs> plasma. plasma. <laughs> so I was, um, I was enthralled. I was like, Jesus, it's taken a season and a half to get here. Uh, no, but yeah. here we are. And so there's Spartans fighting and yeah. there's elites, there's the, the swords. I mean, we got Master Chief fighting outside of his armor, fist fighting an elite with a bloody laser sword and... Out of his armor. Yeah, out of his armor. But you know, because it's, it's got it's, yeah, out of his armor. <laughs> We're gonna see his face. We're paying for this actor. We're gonna see his face. No, <laughs> that's the, that's the luxury of not having to pay for the actor all the way. Uh, do, you said there were new writers and showrunners. Yes, for this season. So I'm assuming that the people that were in charge of season one were fired because they hadn't. Well, done... the people that were in charge of it probably fired the people that they hired and went, "This is not working." So you're gone. Now you guys try You guys it. go. And it's, it seems... We need I mean, it's action. definitely better than the first season. Ye just after that one episode alone. So... <laughs> now, if you... So I'm just saying, if you like spectacle, if you like sci-fi, and you like pew-pew, bang-bang, explosions, <laughs> season two, episode four of Halo is probably the first episode to start, if you're going to consider watching the show. Oh, dear. <clears throat> um, but uh, after that, though, there is one thing I do want to bring up. Mm. Uh, this was a film... You know, I was pretty pretty excited about it when I heard about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, there, there's a, a bit of a guilty pleasure that you might say I might have. I, I, I might like my shark movies. Oh, he, this is not a guilty pleasure, Gary. This is a crack cocaine addiction. Well, I, I mean... All I, it has to have is a thin <laughs> plot and you're all over it. A thin plot? <laughs> yeah. I like sharks, okay? And, you know, I'm like, we've had snakes on a plane. Yeah. Now we're going to have sharks. On a plane. Oh, this man. film was called No Way Up. And uh, it follows characters from different backgrounds that are thrown together when a plane they're traveling on crashes into the Pacific Ocean. And a nightmare uh, fight for survival ensues when the air supply starts running out. So basically a plane full of people crash. Plane goes underwater. It's yeah. kind of at an angle. It's got a hole in the side of the plane. So hole it starts filling with water. And the sharks come in and eat all the bodies. And then they realize there's still people on the plane. So they start trying to eat the people and sink the plane further. It sounds amazing. It's got Cole Meany in it, you know? Chief O'Brien from o Star Trek. Oh my God, that definitely... Why is this film not in the cinema again, Oscars? Because it sucks. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. my God, what a shock. <laughs> oh, it was so bad. Like, the sharks are in it for about a minute. Total. <laughs> How long's yeah. the film? An hour and a half. Oh, it's not bad, I suppose. It's but not bad, hour, but it's like... It is... The acting is bad. The stereotypical... <laughs> survivors are bad it was like Roland Emmerich and fucking Dean Devlin write better schlock than this uh, and this is just a shark movie on a plane and this is coming from a guy ladies and gentlemen who watches a lot of bad shark movies how yeah. many of the shark nados have you seen uh, like four of them four I, I didn't see all of them I did draw the line not yet not yet he hasn't <laughs> yeah. seen all of them but he's seen four yeah, shark nado movies when there's a shortage movie. of shark movies I know I've got those to break in case of emergency <laughs> <laughs> this movie was worse than those four that says a lot. Yeah, it was. It was. 
Oh, so disappointing. So disappointing. I kind of feel like asking you how it ended, just so we could... Sp- but I don't want to spoil it for anybody. Oh, but, like, like, when you see all the survivors that have survived the initial crash, you can go, survive, 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 done. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Instantly, instantly, you'll know instantly. who's getting out alive. <laughs> oh, shame. All right, well, I think uh, we're going to move into some news. Okay, okay. Now, it's always sad when we have to do this. Oh, some this some of these hurt more than others. Yeah. And this one, this one upsets. Uh, we're going to talk about Carl Weathers, who has passed away at the age of 76. Dylan, you son of a bitch. Yeah. Carl Weathers originally started out in sports, uh, playing for the Oakland uh, Raiders back in the 1970s. But mm. due to injuries, he then focused on his um, other other uh, interests, which was acting and theater. Yeah. And in 1976, Carl played one of his most iconic roles in all of cinema, Apollo Creed in Rocky and then its sequels as well. Yeah. Sylvester Stallone paid tribute in a heartfelt uh, video saying, We lost a legend yesterday. My life was forever changed for the better the day I met Carl Weathers. Rest in peace. Rest in peace? <laughs> Almost a peace to... Rest in peace and keep punching. Uh, Carl Weathers will also be forever remembered for his roles in Predator, The Mandalorian, Happy Gilmore, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He was in Close Encounters of the Third Kind? He was one of the sergeant generals, oh, the military guys. Oh, shit, man. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man, like, that hurt. I was sat at home. I was like, what do I want to watch? You know, it was like 8 o'clock at night, and I was just flicking through my phone, and somebody had just posted a thing saying R.O.P. Carl Weathers, and I was like, what? no friggin' way. Because obviously you got to double check everything Yeah, nowadays, exactly. It's a, it was a shock, yeah. Know. It's fake, um, and and so I clicked on it, and I realized, oh Jesus Christ, he has. And so as soon as that, I decided to put Predator on. Nice, yeah. I just watched Predator. I was, I knew I could have watched Rocky. And in in fairness, I think Rocky uh, Apollo Creed is his better role than Dylan. Yes, like, Dylan is great. Well, D- he, Dylan, Dylan's kind of he's almost like the Burke character because Dylan you forget yeah. he's the one who set them up into the jungle in the first exactly, place exactly exactly yeah but but uh, but at the same time um, but he, he's he's not he's not a sleazeball like Burke he, he didn't intentionally send them there to, to mess around he sent mm. them in there to take out the rebels he didn't know about the Predator yeah it's true the Predator was something yeah, else yeah yeah but, but then you remember Apollo Creed and like how can one character have such an impact like Boom, Rocky won. Everybody's got to remember, Rocky doesn't win that one. Yeah. You know, Apollo takes that fight. Rocky 2, they have that hell of a fight at the end. Yeah, he loses the title, but he, you know, he'd, he'd already almost lost it in the first one. Yeah. Rocky 3, he trains. Yeah, their friendship, Rocky, man, is oh, so, the run so on the good. Beach. Yeah. And then, and then, oh man, number four. Yeah. You know. I There's mean, but the no Creed name is still out. going, you know. So, oh, uh, even yes. though we've lost uh, Carl Weathers, uh, the I, Creed name it's still going and I, it's being carried well. I keep hearing about Action Jackson. I'm like, I, I, I need I, to if, see that one. If I've seen it, I've forgotten it. I need to watch it again. But yeah, hell yeah, yeah. Well, here's an interesting new story for you. Oh yeah, <clears throat> Nicholas Cage playing a live action Spider Man. Uh, yeah, well, he's the noir Spider Man. Well, Spider-Man that's right. English, um, now, the Madam Web and well, other Sony related. Marvel cinematic characters Fucking hell. might not be doing very well. You know, it's bombing every which way but up. You know, and while the animated Spider-Man films, on the other hand, across the universe and yep. uh, whatnot, have done remarkably well, and now Nick Cage is actually in talks to play a live-action version of his noir Spidey character yeah. from the multiverse. Yeah, and uh, well, will this be shot in black and white? Will Nick Cage actually be cast? It will it be animated? I do like. I, like if you were gonna do it live, yeah. it should be black and white, and it should be they. Sh- the problem, the problem Sony keeps doing, and it's the same thing that DC keep or, or have been doing, oh. is that Sony aren't being consistent with their films. They're just mm. they're just dropping these films with these names, which have no connection to Spider Man or the Spider Man universe that we know of. But they're hoping that it will hook, um, and people will like it. And uh, it will start a whole new series. They 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 try to do it with Amazing Spider Man one and two. Sure, yeah. And that didn't that didn't work. Nobody could take Andrew Garfield as an actor. I liked him. I like the, Andrew Garfield. But the films around him 
didn't work. I mean, fucking hell, Electro. <laughs> it's, well, yeah. I mean, that's why they tried to fix that, didn't they? With uh... Yeah, yeah, but that was Disney yeah. as well, going, well, we, we, we kind of own... We'll polish over what you did. Yeah, we yeah. kind of own Tom Holland at the moment because he's, the Spider-Man's doing successful in our movie, so we'll give you some leeway and we'll let you do whatever you want. And so then they, what? They come out with Morbius. Then they come out with fucking Venom 1 and 2. All three of those movies have no real connection to the Spider-Man universe, and that, and yet they should. But yeah, there's a Spider-Man in their universe, but it's just never there. Just never there. <laughs> Craven, there's a Craven coming soon. I don't even know who that is. It's Craven the Hunter. Uh, it's basically he's another Spider-Man villain who oh. Spider-Man helped beat him. But in this movie, he, there's no connection to Spider-Man. Just like Madam Web, it's like a random guy who gets the powers and it's like, oh, where's he going? Well, he's going to America, to a city. Why don't you just say New York? <laughs> because because we can't, because then you might you might guess where he's going. <laughs> um, I've been reading stuff about Madam In fact, I actually wikied Madam Web and I read for it and I was like, you know what? If it was done by Marvel mm-hmm. it, and, if, and if it was a TV series... It but could it probably still have just been terrible. <laughs> it, no, no, it, it wouldn't have been terrible. It would have kind of made sense because there's a few little things in the Madam Web plot that, like I said, Sony are kind of loosely tying to the universe. Okay. So if you had the contractual rights and you went through those threads, then you could instill that character into this universe and build it, you know, work with your main character, Spider-Man, and build Madam Web around it. Sure, yeah. But they don't have Spider-Man. So they're like, ah, oh, yeah. See, there's these little, there's these little links, right? That will go nowhere. Yeah. There's these little links, right? And uh, yeah, I don't see a Madam Web two going into production no anytime soon. Way. No. Uh, well, but Nick Cage and live action Spider Man, I'm in. Yeah. Especially a noir version. A noir one. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, uh, next news story for you is that there are not one, not two, not three, but four Beatles biopic films in pre production right now. One for each member of the band. Oh, God. Now, this is what? Sam Mendes, who most recently directed Skyfall, James Bond. Uh, he'll be directing all four films at once. And uh, he, with a planned release window of 2027 for all four movies. Each story will interconnect with the other, mm. with a plan to follow each band member's perspective through the years of the Beatles, like from the rock and rock and roll era to the psychedelic era, yep, yep. all the way to the split up. So we get to see all of the perspectives, one after the other in, in that order. So uh, and now Sam Mendes has said he's honored to be telling the story of the greatest rock band of all time. And he's excited to challenge the notion of what constitutes a trip to the movies. Uh, Pippa Harris, the producer on the film, said... Uh, we intend this to be a uniquely thrilling and epic cinematic experience. Four films told from four different perspectives, which tell a single story about the most celebrated band of all time. Ooh. Now, uh, I, I, it, considering if they do one a quarter throughout the year, like that's kind of something to get excited for. If you see the first one and it's good, you're like, well, I've got three more. I get to see this story again, but from another perspective. Yeah, 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 I get yeah, to yeah. see how the band gelled and worked together their rise to fame the creation of the music the songs celebrate all things Beatles I, 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 Sam Mendes is a talented and great director yeah but are biopics kind of uh, burning out now I don't think I think they're just getting started no I don't think so mate that, I mean Bob Marley's one is it's doing is really in, well it's is done, it? yeah that's why it's doing really really well see the, the funny thing is like I've 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 still not watched the Queen one Queen one was was okay. I mean, it was tame. I, I've still but it was not. Good. I've still not watched the Elton John one. Um, I is that Rocket Man? Rocket Man, yeah, great fun. Like I, I the thing Walk is, the Line. You know, there's um, there, there's been so many good ones. Yeah, well, the like the funny thing is, like the first ever one I ever watched was um, What's Love Got to Do with It by Tina Turner. Nice. Yeah. And I thought that I thought that one was outstanding. So I I I like biopics, but at the same time, like if I know too much of the history. Sometimes I feel like it, you know, movies just over dramatize a lot of the things. Well, of course, yeah. You know, they've got to. They've got to make it more entertaining, to just sort of keep you yeah. enraptured. So, like, like um, this idea, it, it 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 runs a really fine line where, like you said, you could go and watch the first one and go, "Oh my god, I can't wait to go back and watch the other three from a different spe- perspective." But then you might watch the second one and be like, 
I'm not bothered about going and watch the other two mm-hmm. at this point because this may have been the best one or that one might have well, not been it, great. It depends which beetle you kind of want the perspective of. Well, you know? yeah, you yeah, can yeah. just like pick one beetle, watch you, one film and go, now I can... understand it from that one guy's perspective. Yeah, well, that's what you're saying. But like, are all these, are all four films going to be judged as one movie? No. Um, or are they, well, that's what I'm saying. Are they all going to be, are all their box office numbers going to be judged Individually, individually, yeah. and then what does that say about individual? It, who's the members? most popular Beatles? Well, right? that's what. Yeah, that's it. Like you know, are, it's gonna are, be Lennon. Are more, it? Yeah. Well, that's it. <laughs> more people are gonna go. I can't wait to go see what happens to John Lennon. No, I'm just telling you right. Spoilers. I didn't tell you that. Spoilers. <laughs> Don't catch her in the rye. Read that motherfucking book. Same with like Paul McCartney. Everybody will go see Paul, and everybody yeah. goes. I mean, strangely enough, I wonder if they'll kill him off halfway for a movie and bring him back as a clone. Don't you know that story? Paul McCartney's dead. No. Yeah, they replaced him, same as they did with um, what's her name? Uh, face skater, skater girl, Avril Lavigne. They replaced okay. her as well. You know, Taylor Swift's not real. The lizard people are taking over, man. Um, that's why they killed John Lennon. And then you got George Harrison, you know, um, and Ringo Starr. I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing <laughs> Ringo's. I think George's would be George. George, I always did like because he did do some good music after. Yeah. I, I think it's going to be fascinating. I, I really do. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. It could be really fascinating. You could get all four movies and be like, those are the great... Because I really only know them as a made. group, you know? <laughs> I, like I said, I followed them as a group and then followed them as in the Individual individuals yeah. after. Because the Beatles really was a fairly short-lived affair. Yeah, but it was controversial. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they turned the world on its head. Yeah. Panic, right? Girls rushing down the street in yeah. mobs. <laughs> I mean, saying that they still do that. People do still do that nowadays. Bye. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, speaking of biopics, Ridley Scott is oh. now currently in talks to direct a Bee Gees biopic. What the? F- <laughs> I just said too many. <laughs> Not enough, apparently. Now, th- this is a film though that has been uh, ha- had. Very little momentum over the years, but it's something that I think Ridley Scott wanted to make as far as 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, And I think he was actually at one point even going to work on a movie with some of the members of uh, the Bee Gees, but it it fell through for whatever reason. Um, But uh, now uh, Paramount Studios, who are making the Bee Gees movie with Ridley Scott, are very excited with some of the dailies they're seeing of Gladiator 2. They've just gone, you know what, Ridley, you want to do that Bee Gees movie? You go ahead. Like, we know you're going to make us millions with Gladiator 2, so... Is it actually called Gladiator 2? Yeah. I would love... Gladiator 2! <laughs> Be like, whoa! I mean, it might have a subtitle, but... Back to the... Point. Yeah, Gladiator 2, back to the Coliseum. Right. You know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, again, at Bee Gees, I don't really know that much about them. They seem very secretive, really. Yeah. You know, after, I, again, another short-lived uh, group, really. I, I know, well, but, I know... But they, they, they ushered in almost disco. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, it, and I think it also died on their shoulders as well. Probably like they were yeah. I don't know. I'd be, I want to find out. Wait. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm like, of all of the biopics they could do, I'm, the Beatles and the Bee Gees, I'm like, you know, I'm curious. Yeah. yeah. And, Everyone. of course, it's Ridley Scott. Now, of course, he's not exactly known for his um, our, our uh, historically accurateness, especially no. after uh, Napoleon. Uh, but hopefully uh, the Bee Gees is, uh, tells, well, does tell the true the true story. I mean, if they if they end up like, Stop in the Third World War or something during the movie. I'd be like, <laughs> hang on a minute. Disco wasn't that good. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, now this next news story. Um, I don't know. I'm still don't know how I, how I'm feeling about this one. Okay. Uh, but Luc Besson. Yeah. Has uh, agreed and is now signed on to make a Dracula film. Okay. Uh, his... Not a vampire film, but a Dracula. Dra- film. The Dracula. The, the Dracula. Dracula. The Dracula. Uh, he's cast Landry Jones and Christoph Waltz so far. Waltz is fucking Van Helsing, yeah. I'm telling you now. I, I, that's who I think he's going to be. That's who I think. Now, according to Deadline, uh, Besson's film will dive deeper into the origins of the character Prince Vladimir. Yeah. I'm like, I've heard this before. Yeah, who, after the death of his beloved wife, forswears God and has turned into a fanged fiend for his trouble. Uh, Landry Jones, who was in The Dead Don't Die, Love Lords it. of Chaos, X Men First Class. He was Banshee in X Men. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, he's going to be playing Dracula himself. And we don't know who Christoph Waltz is going to be playing yet, he... but I think Van Helsing. Uh, Landry Jones, he was in X Men First Class, Banshee. He played Banshee. Yeah. He was the guy in Byzantium. 
I can't remember. Byzantium, the vampire. I remember movie. the film, but I don't remember who, he was, who was in it. He was the he was the guy who uh, Cerise Rowan. I don't know if I got the name wrong. Sorry, um, was in love with, okay. and he had a and he had a uh, something wrong with his blood. Yeah, and then she takes him at the end. And if he if he is, he could be he could be really good. Actually. Yeah, but yeah, I reckon. But the thing is, I'm like Luc Besson. Like the last two times I went to the cinema to watch his films, I either fell asleep or I walked out. What did you watch? It was that space one, the one that was like three, eight, four, ten hours long. Oh, like the what the, the, the Thousand remember. Planets one. Yeah, Valerian. Valerian, Valerian that was it. Oh, uh, like, yeah, that, no. that was Fifth I... Element was his best sci-fi movie. Yeah, and I don't. I... Fifth Element was great. Leon was great. Um, he did dive out into the big blue, which wasn't very good. For me, Lupus on it's made more duds than hits, and I just, I don't, I just don't want to see a campy, over the top <laughs> Dracula movie where he's trying and it's just phony. It just feels like Luke Besson's movies are phony. And no, I know because no, I no, love no, no. Leon. Leon is yeah. one of my favorite That's movies. It. He... But I think Luke Besson is a hack fraud it... who cannot make anything to save his life these days. There I'm are just... there are worse directors. Yeah, but for me, there Luke Besson is just like directors. fall Fucking... from grace. It's just I'm nothing, like, yeah, and, he's, yeah. and he's just hitting every movie on but, his way down. Yeah, but uh, I mean, was he really even in the top notch at any point anyway? It was for me with Leon. I mean, the yeah, professional. Well, that's it. Leon, Leon was was his thing, but then after that, like. You know, they didn't give him the scripts like he, he should have had. I don't know. You know, they know. <laughs> like if he can hit Dracula with the same kind of grittiness that he had when he was hitting Leon, then yeah, brilliant. If he decides to go, like you said, over the top artsy fartsy like he did with Valerian and the fifth element, that might be a little bit too much. But then again, he's working with Christoph Waltz. I, I trust Christoph Waltz. I think he can hold any fucking performance. Agreed. You, you yeah. throw at him. Yeah. Um, Landry Jones, I like him. Yeah. Um, I I think yeah, if he's given a good lead part and good direction, then he could do really well. And the three honestly, I'm, 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 in my mind, I'm just seeing like Renfield two by Luc Besson. That's 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 all I'm seeing. Man, just, good because Renfield was great. Like, oh no, it was. <laughs> Renfield was fun. Exactly, but I, do want, I want I want a good Dracula movie. I just Man, Luke Besson's just the last one of the last directors I would pick for this project. You know what? If this movie is worse than Halloween Kills or Halloween Ends, I will agree with you and say Luke Besson should hang it up. <laughs> but if it's not, then sure, fuck David Gordon Green. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, actors that uh, did hang it up, but right, coming yeah. back out of retirement, okay, one more time. Jim Carrey is coming out of retirement to play Dr. Robotnik in yeah. Sonic 3. Yeah, of course he is. Jeff Fowler's back as director for the third time as well, and he'll also be bringing back Tails and Knuckles yeah. whilst teasing the appearance of Shadow the Hedgehog. Yeah. Uh, the film's going to be out this Christmas. Did you watch the second one? Uh, I didn't know. But, oh, that, but that's because I'm like, it's the only Jim Carrey performance that I've not seen yet. So it's like breaking case of emergency. Have you watched the first one? Yeah. That's I watched like, it just because of Jim Carrey. I was like, I want to see him up to his old antics again that's like he it. was. The first one I didn't think I thought was going to be a dud and not work, but he held that movie together. The sequel yeah. works really well of because of his interactions of with Sonic and Knuckles. Yeah. You're like, you know that they're not real and he's <laughs> just kind of talking just to, to a voice but he does it so well i could watch him as as fucking dr robotnik for hours yeah you yeah. know and <laughs> i i love this the energy he has he, yeah i love the fact that sonic is going to beat him every time but like for 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 90 percent of the movie he's always got he, he always just happens to be two steps ahead yeah you know and yeah. the bigger robot and all this other shit and then he gets defeated i'm like no <laughs> when's the third movie out this christmas <laughs> yeah yeah well all righty well going from uh family uh, friendly to very not <laughs> we've got some new evil dead news oh uh and the next evil dead film is in the early stages of development right now Ooh. uh sam raimi and robert tapper have hired I'm going to try and pronounce the name correctly. Okay. Uh, Sebastian Vanacek. Vanacek, yeah. Vanacek. Vanacek. I think you might yeah. be right, yeah. Uh, he's going to be helming uh, the new film for Ghost House Pictures. Uh, recently, uh, Sebastian had success with a film called Vermin, oh. or a.k.a. Infested, which is a French horror film. 
Right now, it's winning uh, Best Picture Ooh. and Best Director at Fantastic Ooh. Fest, mm-hmm. among other awards at other film festivals. You know, I think it's great that Sam and Rob are finding new and up-and-coming directors yeah, yeah. Um, that show great potential for filmmaking and horror and helping them get started by tackling new iterations within the world of the Evil Dead. Nice. Um, as a side note, I also just want to say it also seems that there's still some talks about a sequel to Evil Dead Rise, uh, as uh, I think it was Lee Cronin yeah. has also said that he has ideas for his Evil Dead Rise trilogy. So we've got these Evil Dead side calls all being made yeah. by these up-and-coming directors. Now, if they are as fresh and as rotten, I guess, as Evil Dead Rise is, we've got nothing to worry about. Now, like we said, this uh, new director, Sebastian Ivanacek, with uh, with his Infested movie, which is ba- it's basically arachnophobia in a, in a French apartment blog nice. i believe shudder has now going to have exclusive distribution rights for streaming it i can't wait to see this film just because now that we know he's been tapped by sam and rob yeah. to make new evil dead i'm like well i want to see what he did to get their attention to go you evil dead uh, make well, it now if he could make some really good body horror stuff yeah. they'd probably be all on that but with with cronin lee cronin he'll have to get the approval from them to make his oh of sequel, course right? yeah but, that, but i mean i imagine he's built up a relationship with them based on that well what happens if they get the two of them to kind of work together on the sequel so that you carry on evil dead rise into mm-hmm. number two but you just up the body horror yeah. and style that well, manichek can bring I, I think sebastian's got his own script and idea though i think he has oh, his yeah. own well, story that he wants to do everybody always so, has but like yeah. you said you you, you you don't want too many projects going off because... one every two years three years yeah that's yeah, absolutely but, fine well, yeah that's 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 fine uh, but as long as they can stay consistent because that's the one thing we've always said about evil dead is that they've maintained a consistency but that's it. But, of but the Sam story. and Rob and Ivan yeah. and Bruce, they're overseers they're the ones... of the whole thing. So and it's, it's... they're not going to let it go off the wrong Yeah, tangent. no, no, I get that. But at the same time, I just think it's really ironic as well that, that, that the four of them started off as like low budget, you know, guys yeah. running out there with a camera trying to get funding <laughs> from every Tom, Dick and Harry around. And now they're the guys going, hey... We got but, money. But yeah, but now they're able to film. make sure that those that are not having to go round there and, you know, run up credits yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, checks. It's, great. it's fucking great. I think it's, it's great. great. It's I love great. it. Yeah. I love it. Well, I think uh, this is something I did love. Oh. But it has, has come to an abrupt and sudden end. Yeah. Uh, Slayers. Uh, the Buffy the Vampire Slayer spin-off Audible yes. uh, chapters have just been cancelled by Disney after just one season of the audio drama. Yeah, uh, Christopher Golden, who co-created and co-wrote the project, has said, hugely disappointed to share that, despite its enormous success, Disney has refused to allow Audible to proceed with future seasons of Slayer's <laughs> yeah. a buffy verse story. You know, yeah. To my knowledge, Disney have provided... No explanation. Other than they own it. Other than they own it. But they it, it made them money. And then they went cancelled. Yeah, but if they cancel it, they can start it up on their own grounds. It is their own grounds. No, Audible. It's yeah, no, Audible. but made by Disney. Right, but... If Disney agree- had to have agreed it, it's from them that it's happened. Yeah, but, but Disney can't stream Audible only, the, so... <laughs> the, the thing I found with this was this just seemed to come out of nowhere. Um, and it was all... And I, I thought it was a bit sus because they were like oh yeah we're 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 doing this slayer story but we are not incorporating uh sarah michelle geller she didn't want to be involved yeah she didn't want to be involved uh uh um xander you know we're 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 only staying on focus on these what? particular characters and i was just like if you interview read with the uh um amber benson and the other writer um, Christopher Golden. Yeah. Uh, they had uh, Kelsey Grammer, who played Glory, coming back for the next season. Right, right, right. They had a- anyone that wasn't involved in the first season was coming back in season two, three, or four. Like they had all of these planned, um, but now it's not happening. You know, I mean, they already they, they had James Masters, Chris Carpenter, Anthony yeah. Head, Julia yeah. Landu, Emma Caulfield, Amber Benson, uh, James C. Leary, Danny Strong, and so many yeah. more. So, uh, but so yeah, it's a, it's kind of a shame, really. Because uh, uh, I uh, I haven't finished it yet. I'm halfway through it. It's it's quite long. Yeah. It's like six hours. Like broken, you know, where there's multiple episodes. But yeah, so it's just a shame that there's no more Buffy coming from 
all of those actors from that show that still love playing those characters and having fun with it. So it's just kind of a shame yeah. that the rug got pulled out of that one. Now, the only thing I can think of as to why Disney have not given them an explanation as to why they've pulled the plug yeah. on this successful Dis- Buffy spinoff is that there is a Buffy spinoff or a Buffy remake in, in development. The That's what I was so just thinking. So they don't want two Buffy projects going on at the same time. Um, so, meh. Yeah, they, and they might have cancelled it and gone, right, we'll cancel it. What are we going to do? Come and work for us because we're doing this other thing. <sighs> well, maybe. Uh, but it's going to be a reboot, though. And what, it's... Why should we, Disney? Money. We're here! <laughs> Get on the bus! <laughs> Disney's got money? Supposedly. <laughs> Alrighty, well, I got some quick fire news for you. Okay. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola's Megalopolis film has been teased with a single image. You know, this director at the age of 84, mm. uh, he's back in the director's chair to helm a passion project uh, for something that he's been working on since the 1980s. Wow. He has put forward $120 million of his own money to finance the film. The cast so far includes Audrey Plaza, Adam Driver, Shia LaBeouf, Dustin Hoffman, John Voigt, Lawrence Fishburne, James Remar, Forrest Whitaker, Talia Shire, Giancarlo Esposito, and Jason Schwartzman have all been wow, cast. That's a lineup. And that, that's not even all the cast. Like no. there's even more than that. I'm like, that that like you've just said, it's one hell of a cast. Yeah. Uh, the story will follow an architect who wants to rebuild New York City uh, as a utopia following a devastating disaster. So, I mean, Francis Ford Coppola, like, pretty much a legend in, in, in cinema. Yeah. Uh, one hell of a cast. You know, maybe a, a swan song film for him. Yeah, because it, you know, here... Adam Driver is amazing. Shia LaBeouf, I think, is great. Dustin Hoffman is amazing. Yeah. Fucking John Voight, Lawrence Fishburne, James Remar. Just fucking... He's fucking James Remar. I love James <laughs> right? Remar. Um, he was great in those Saw movies. Yeah, he was great in Saw. Um, <laughs> fucking Forrest Worker. I haven't seen Forrest Worker in ages, but I, I loved him as fucking... Um, uh, he was the rebel leader in uh, Rogue One. Yeah, yeah. Is it Sol... Sol Guerrero? Yeah. Sol Guerrero? Yeah, yeah I absolutely yeah. love them as that. Actually, I, I still love Forrest Whitaker in fucking Battlefield Earth. <laughs> oh, God. That film's bad, but man, I still like it. I, I still have fun with it. Uh, Dan Trachtenberg is returning to the Predator universe with Predator Badlands. Oh. Now, it's not planned as an actual sequel to Prey, mm. but another standalone Predator film. Mm-hmm. This time... In the future. Something Predator films have never done before. Mad Max Predator. Right? (laughs) So the only other tidbit of information so far is that it will have a female lead, similar to Prey. Okay. uh, That uh, Patrick Aysen, who wrote and worked with Dan on Prey, is also returning to pen uh, Predator Badlands. And from the reports, the script is so far uh, nearly finished. And so cameras are going to be rolling as early as July this year. So, my great. uh, Hopefully this one gets a cinema release. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, technically, I could watch Prey on the cinema screen. Well, you can day. now, yeah, but I'm, not on, I'm talking officially. <laughs> yeah, So we all yeah, get to yeah, enjoy it. Sure, yeah, not just me on my own. <laughs> uh, Masters of the Universe live-action film project is moving forward uh, with Travis Knight, who directed Bumblebee, uh, tipped to be the director. Yeah. Uh, the new movie rep- will reportedly see a nine-year-old Prince Adam crashing to Earth in a spaceship and being separated from his magical sword, his only link to his home, Eternia. Oh, After what? tracking it down almost two decades later, Adam is whisked back across space to defend his home against the evil forces of Skeletor. Uh, but to defeat such a powerful villain, Prince Adam will first need to uncover the mysteries of his past and become He-Man. Most powerful man in the universe. That sounds such bullshit. I'd rather watch just the original. <laughs> right, the, I, the one that takes place on Earth. I, yeah, well, this <laughs> takes fucking place on Earth, probably. As well, but probably. that's that's what I'm saying is that everybody disses the original Masters Universe because oh, it all takes place on Earth and nothing really happens. And literally, you were reading me the <laughs> yeah. fucking plot of the next one. He crashes where, on Earth. And when cra- he crashes on Earth. He's nine years old. He gets separated from his sword, so he spends <laughs> most of his life growing up in care and not, you know, telling people about he's an alien that gets nobody adopted by the Kents and, and yeah, yeah, goes to school. You know, He'll go to school, he'll go to college, he'll get beaten down. He gets bullied by Skeletor. He gets, he gets bullied by a kid that just happens to look a bit like Skeletor. He'll he'll find the sword, and a 20, 20 quid bet, he, his love interest and two of his friends will get west to Eternia. Yeah. You won't see much of Eternia, just some CGI background, and then he'll fight Skeletor. Accidentally. And no, can can anybody beat Frank Langella? No, not a Skeletor. A Skeletor? No, not in live Mark action. Mark Hamill form. is the voice of Skeletor. Like, it's... Yeah. 
<laughs> I, I, in fairness, if I was if I was a twelve year old boy again, I mm. might want to watch that. Sure. But, but the issue you've got is that I had the luxury of watching the Masters Universe TV series. Yeah, yeah. Then went to the film. Yeah. They yeah. don't have a TV series at the moment. Uh, well, well there's two of them, isn't there? There's two Seven of them. Are, are, well, they're, they're all on net. Yeah, they're on Netflix, but. Trying to, like, I don't know many kids who are like, oh man, I'm watching fucking Masters Universe nowadays. Mm-hmm. They're all watching fucking TikTok and Fortnite videos. Right, yeah. I don't know kids. <laughs> so yeah, probably the C-Band film, probably not the best idea. Yeah. <laughs> could be worse, could be sharks in a fucking plane underwater. It's true. <laughs> could be a Lupus on Dracula movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. Who knows? <laughs> uh, a Greenland has actually got a sequel and it's in the works with uh, Gerard Butler returning um. alongside Morena Barakan. Um, or oh, Baccarin, sorry, of course, yeah. get her name right. wrong. Um, and the previous film's writer and director is also returning. Now, the original film it was an okay disaster film. It followed a family trying to get to Greenland right. uh, after a comet crashed into the earth, causing almost you know um, an extinction level Ex- event. Yeah. So big disaster movie. Family trying to get from A to B. You know, it's uh, it was fine. It had some great set pieces, some okay effects, and it was, it was mostly okay. Yeah. So I'm surprised that there's going to be a follow-up. This time the family emerged from Greenland, yeah. and they need to go find a new home to go and settle down in after the apocalypse, so to speak. So, I know. still haven't seen Greenland. It's it's worth a watch. It's not great, but it's not bad. You know, it's, uh, it has its moments. Right, okay. If, if you like disaster movies, I, I definitely recommend yeah, it. Yeah, I'm yeah. not a big disaster. Linda Linda probably like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Woo-hoo. The game has got a release date of July of 2024. Yeah. Not too long now. I, I'm i going to buy it. I'm just not going to play it. Is that bad? That's a bit sad, yeah. yeah. Like, why buy it? Because you, like, you, well, you you're buying a digital or a physical version? I was going to buy a physical <laughs> copy so then it could go next to my Evil Dead copy and I can sit there looking at it going, hey, look, they made games out of my favourite 80s horror movies. Yeah. Uh, it's just... I. I feel reluctant to play it because fucking Saber burnt me with Evil Dead. You know, I got into Evil Dead, I blasted the shit out of it, I prestiged the character, I leveled it up to fuck, I played for all the glitches and cheaters and all that. I had some really amazing games playing with Gary and all that. That's good. And then they just turned around and went, we're done. And that was a company who actually was working on the game and they had contracts. The guys behind Killer Clowns, I think they're just holding it together, um, making the game. Texas Chainsaw Massacre has already gone and gone off into the sunset in fucking that game realm. So I just feel like this game will come out, people will play it for a little bit, um, and then they'll stop. So well, I'm going to spoil <laughs> So like, like normal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but quicker. But you're quicker, yeah. But quicker. And, and so I, I reckon it is a niche audience for sure. Yeah. But uh, hopefully it does well. I'm hoping, I'm hoping I'm it does well. I'm going to support them. I'm going to buy the game. Yeah. I just probably you're won't just play it. Play it. <laughs> yeah. uh, Beetlejuice sequel gets its full title. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. <laughs> What's the third one going to be called? <laughs> wow. Oh, I have no idea. Uh, Alan Wake 2 is now Remedy's fastest selling game with a, uh, over 1.3 million copies sold. Wow. So very happy for Remedy. Uh, hopefully uh, that's, you know, earned them some money. They can keep making fantastic games. Yeah. Cobra Kai Season 6 is now officially underway. Cameras mm. are rolling. This will be the final season. Uh, co-creator Hayden Schlossberg has confirmed it's the final season, the longest yet, with 10 episodes and a bumper time run for the finale. So we know I, that there's Karate Kid movies in the works as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I think time to I'm end not, Cobra Kai. I'm not watching it. You're not watching Cobra Kai No, finale? I'm not watching Season 6. Okay, then. Because Tori's gone older and she'll just look hotter and i just won't be able to look at the screen <laughs> man come on she was like the pinnacle of the other seasons wasn't she of all the reasons to not watch it <laughs> like that's yours <laughs> i'm trying man like that, that last season like i was always I, like I, she was my girl i was right behind her now Ooh. like danny's door is all right but damn tori bad girl bad girl bad girl all right we got a couple of uh I almost said a couple of twisters for you. <laughs> we got a couple of trailers, starting with twisters. Twisters! <laughs> Glenn Powell and Daisy Edgar Jones go chasing twisters in this new disaster movie. No hint of any uh, surviving cast members from the original in this trailer. Well, it looks this... mostly like a remake of sorts, the exact same storyline, but with 
Well, today's special it, effects. It totally does, doesn't it? Because yeah. they've got the little thing that... Um, well, ben, Storm chasers, want to track tornadoes. Bill Paxton's not in it. Yeah. Uh, Carrie Hughes isn't in it. Yeah. He died. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah. He's not in it. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't think they can afford Helen Hunt's face. <laughs> um, so, yeah, probably... I should best. laugh. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> It's a shame. It's a shame. The first, yeah, but the first one's so good. I'd, I'd rather them try to make a like a, a bit of a, a, a requel sequel, <laughs> right? For, for it, this one, it acknowledges um, the first film happened. Yeah, but now we're going to do it better. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's it's going to be stupid. The first one was stupid, um, but I think what held it together was Bill Paxton. Yeah. Um, this one I don't think will be held together as much. But if the disaster, if it's got the spectacle, if it's got the spectacle, people will be like, "Don't care." Yeah, it's a disaster movie. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, next trailer was for Deadpool and Wolverine. Oh yeah! Uh, the trailer shows how Wade Wilson will be sent to the TVA and then into the MCU as it is now. And the self-proclaimed Marvel Jesus is here to save the MCU <laughs> and break the fourth wall as much as possible. I, I think this trailer looks great. Looks yeah. fun. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, the writers clearly poking fun at Disney, the state of the MCU. Uh, and the fact that we're going to see Hugh Jackman back as Wolverine, even though it's just teased in the trailer, uh, I'm I'm pretty excited for this. Like, I've not been excited for a superhero movie in a little while. So this one is probably going to uh, at least uh, lower the bottom line for Disney, which they've been bouncing off of a little bit. The funny thing much. is, yeah, I'm I'm still holding a little bit of reluctance on this one because I, you know, trilogies. The third one is never as good. Yeah. Um, the second one, the second Deadpool, I thought was was really good because they introduced a lot more characters. Like yeah, you had the Colossus. It Joe, proved that Juggernaut. it wasn't just a one trick. Yeah, as well, that yeah. they could keep making them. Yeah, that X Men nod when he when they closed the door. Yeah. So like, <laughs> if you can keep doing that, that's brilliant because that's the one thing that's been saving Marvel and Disney over um, DC is just the consistency of containing it. You say what you want about all their series and how bad they are, but they're still in this universe. Yeah. And the universe is there and you can do whatever you want. You can watch Luke Cage. You can watch Daredevil. You can watch this. You can watch that. They'll just keep bringing out more. Can't do that with DC. And I think Ryan Reynolds was a loss for them when they didn't bring him back as Green Lantern. And (laughs) Marvel come along and gone, yeah, let's just fucking stick him in a Deadpool suit and let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Alrighty, well that is going to conclude the first part of the podcast. We're going to take a small break, but when we come back, we're going to be answering your questions. Yes. Don't go anywhere. And welcome back to the podcast, where we are going to be answering your questions. Yes. Now we've got a fair few questions. Some of them were holdovers from the last month. From the last month, So we're going to start today with the Facebook questions. Yes. And the first question has come in from Ian Buckingham. (laughs) Woohoo! What up, Ian, you badass, awesome dude. Woo! Uh, that name sounds familiar. Yeah, well, it's mine. Duh. Oh, all right. Yo, <sighs> no, Ian. Bit slow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Ian asks to name a better scene than Gandalf versus the Balrog in Two Towers. Yeah. Party on, dude. Party it's, on, dude. It's because me and Linda were, at this point, when we wrote the questions for this podcast, we were watching the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and I just watched that sequence where Gandalf comes flying down you know, and he catches his sword and he lands on the Balrog's chest and he starts smacking him. I was like, is um, there it, a sequence better is it, than is this? It, that's Return of the King, though. No, no, no. They don't actually no. fight in Two, two Towers. towers. Yeah, no, yeah. Two Towers, they just fall off the bridge. No. Yeah. No, Fellowship, they fall off the bridge. Oh, no, yeah, you're right. Fellowship, they fall off the bridge. <laughs> two Towers starts with him fighting and then he turns up in Fangorn Forest and he says, oh, yeah, I battled a Balrog and we fought in the middle of oh, the earth. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And he goes back and scattered off the white. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's... Yeah. I only watched it last year. <laughs> only? <laughs> yeah, only? but the thing is, it was like a nine hour... <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, but yeah, sequence that is better than that sequence. I mean, that's pretty up there, isn't it? I mean, uh, all right, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, instead of going with the usual, I'll go with the Clendathu drop sequence in oh. um, Starship Troopers. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good. Because I'm saying not, not the two of them it's just fighting scene. in every yeah. fight sequence, but yeah. it's, uh, this, that sequence was yeah. bigger. And that Clendathu where they, <laughs> they come smashing down the, the doors open. Dun, dun, dun. Come on, dun. you apes. <laughs> Oh, man, that, is, that was a good sequence. Uh, oh, man, it's, yeah. What's from, yours? Oh, you know, as a sequence, ah, it's 
it's got to be. I, I, I feel like it's got to be another fight sequence. Oh, no, actually. I'm, it sounds crazy. But. I want to say that door sequence in Dread with Urban. Yeah. Where they kick open the door and everything's in slow so, motion. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they just start shooting. That sequence is pretty fucking epic. That is. It's, yeah. You know, it's been a minute now since I've seen Dread. Oh, so it's good. But yeah, it's oh yeah. Yeah, I just watched. I watched that in three D in the cinema. Yeah. It was it was great. It was great. When he throws Mama off the top. Yeah. <laughs> the slow mo so drop. Oh, oh, one more, one more sequence. Actually, okay, I saw it. Today, I saw it today. Uh, the last stand of General Mifuni in uh, the third Matrix movie. Mm, when sure. they were there with the with the mechs and he's just like yeah. I mean that <laughs> film is just the spectacle isn't it but yeah um, yeah 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 awesome <laughs> cheers for the question Ian <laughs> next question is from Ross Munro what up Ross yo Ross I recently saw Superman the Christopher Reeves on my 55 inch TV Ooh. Uh, I, I watched five minutes and then turned it off and then I pulled out my projector screen at 100 inches and plugged in a fire stick and put Superman on again and watched the whole film. Oh. Spent 250 on the projector and screen. It's great for older films. Yeah. So like me, do you think big screen better? Takes me back to the cinema. Uh, PS uh, wired up two JBL 710s to the projector and the sound is important. Um, Friday the 13th never sounded better. Uh, yeah, uh, perfect, Monroe. I mean, uh, if you can get a bigger screen to watch your film on, do it absolutely uh, it's it's going to be better especially on a projector i yeah. mentioned uh, earlier on uh, there was an opportunity when i was a, a technician i got to borrow the projector and i i was playing my xbox games playstation games mm-hmm. and watching movies mm-hmm. and tv mm-hmm. anything it was just they don't need a tv when i got the projector the only thing is i needed a, it to be a dark blank white wall <laughs> right, as well, yeah. yeah just a blank wall and you needed it to be dark just to get the you know great great picture yeah so like trying to watch something in the afternoon you just it's not going to work. No. Well, I mean, projectors have probably gotten a lot better now. Uh, but, no, uh, they're, they're still really... You, you yeah. need black. Yeah. For, for it to be able to see visually yeah. absolutely everything. Uh, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, when I was... When, when I realised I could get access to a cinema screen to myself, uh, my mind just blew about what opportunities I had to see something on the TV that I... On a big screen that I never got the chance to see. Like... Like, in my mind, all I want to see is the Back to the Future trilogy on the big screen. Nice. Back to back, all three of them, just all at once if I get the chance. Like I said, with the access to the cinema screen, I took my Switch. I hooked my Switch up to it, and I played Duke Nukem 3D. (laughs) And I walked... Like, like it was really pixelated, but I walked up to the cinema in Hollywood Holocaust while in the cinema, and I'm like, this is amazing. Technology doesn't get any better. Like, I love it. Shake it, baby. Yeah, shake it, baby. <laughs> it's on a cinema screen. Bigger the better. Yeah. I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong. If you've got, if you're stuck with your phone, enjoy your phone, but upgrade. Yeah. I mean, I, I enjoy watching films on the big screen. I love the cinema experience. Love the sound as well. When you, when you have that, it's, yeah, it, you can have a big screen TV and sound system, but yeah, the cinema is just, something special mm. about that so mm. but yeah if you have your own projector in your own you know your your own home cinema you're sorted do it yeah nice do one it. ross and of course great choice with uh, uh og superman as well love like, that love that yeah i like you said friday for eight but I'm, that might go on my list nice friday yeah for eight series yeah. yeah hell yeah Next question is from Natalie Holbert what up natalie yo natalie i uh, hope the new year is treating you gentlemen favorably <laughs> I'm basing my question on the smashing review of House of Wax. Oh, man. Would you like... Who, sorry, would you like to see given the torture wax treatment? Mm-hmm. You can pick a character from a film or, whispering, someone from your own lives. <laughs> from your own lives. Uh, you may wish to call the uh, call them Gertrude or Horace for anonymity. Yes, course. yes. Uh, but I mean, I was trying. I was trying to think. I was like, who is the most sleaze bag villain? Yeah, you know, I mean, for number one for me is going to be Carter Burke from Aliens. Yeah. I was like, I mean, he kind of gets it pretty bad. I mean, he probably does deserve the the House of Wax treatment. Um, mm. I was like, who else? I mean, I was like, I was like, oh, I mean, anyone who played a Nazi in any uh, any movie. Uh John yeah. Doe from Seven. Yeah, John Doe from Seven. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just. I mean, just just Kevin Spacey, really. <laughs> <laughs> just Kevin Spacey. Yeah. Yeah, Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Putin. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. Was, is the leader of North Korea that guy as well? Yeah. All of the really, really bad people <laughs> should get covered in wax. They should get the House of Wax torture yeah. treatment. And then they should have that thing happen to him, like um, Jared has in the film, where they kind of pull the skin and it pulls the skin down, but he's still alive, but he can't move. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> It's nasty. I mean, it yeah. is. A, it's a it's a horrifying way to go. So, but at the same time, I'm just like, I'd, I'd probably enjoy the torture sequence if it was on these horrible people. It's uh, yeah. I don't yeah. Know. It's but, like, uh, well, if it's got to be horrible people. You wouldn't do it to somebody nice. Would you? Well, I mean, that's what happens in the film, though. That's what I mean. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, Jared Padalecki, kind of the supernatural guy. <laughs> Imagine doing it to Mary Poppins. That's better. <laughs> Jesus, no. <laughs> 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 it's just it's. I mean, <laughs> Uh, it's just horrifying, actually. <laughs> just hearing the screams. Yeah, don't do it to Emily Blunt. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know what? I was, uh, as I was upset about the uh, that post office scam mm. that came to light not too long ago. Okay. So whoever was responsible for the British post office scam, whoever was the one that stole all that money from those people and sent them to jail and whatnot, yeah. whoever that was, them they need to them, be them. they need to be waxed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and whoever the motherfucker was who actually also scammed my mum last year as well. Savage. So, yeah, yeah, that guy as well. Yeah. All of them get so All the scammers. The all, all the scammers all the of the world. Yeah. We're all getting all waxed. All the scammers. <laughs> We're going to get you. I'm all fired up now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. <laughs> Next question is from David Allen Evans. What up, David? Happy New Year. Uh, any of you guys got a film or series of films you really like that get such a bad rep uh, that it's become shorthand for perceived low quality. So much so that you cannot fathom why it would be considered that bad. I don't mean fanboy knee-jerk reaction, but genuine befuddlement why the film you like has become a punching bag. Keep on keeping on. Cheers, David, for the question. Um, now, I had to think hard on this one. Okay, yeah. Um, and I, I know why most people bash a film one way or the other, but I actually struggled to think of one. I mean, you know, some point out to like Battlestar Galactica and Lost as being really dropping the ball with the endings. Mm. Um, and, and it's listed in most people's worst endings for a TV show, but I was fine with it. Same as the recent Dexter special. Dexter, the, the first ending for dexter was a bad ending yeah so um, I, I i mean and people use it as an example for bad endings and i'm the one who go i actually didn't think it was that bad i liked i liked both dexter endings i i'm kind of the same with cabin fever I, okay i don't get how people don't like cabin fever i think it's really funny i think it's really unique i think it you know in comparison to other horror movies that have been made or even talked about like it's it is superior, but immediately as soon as you say cabin fever, people immediately Ugh, think of Eli, Eli Roth, Roth yeah. and immediately go to Hostel, and so they immediately go, "Oh yeah, that movie was terrible." And I'm like, "No, no, oh yeah, yeah." Some people bash on World War Z, but that's because it's a bad film. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, eh. It's the same with Dark Fate when people go, eh, "I like Dark Fate." It's the eh. <laughs> It's got some good action scenes, but yeah, the story and everything else is... And special effects are good. <laughs> God damn it. But, uh, but yeah, it's a great question though, David. It is a tough one. It's a tough one because I'm, I mean, I'm pretty understanding when people don't like something. I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, I, I don't really tend to have any... Uh, uh, I don't really feel like I have anything that I like that is being used as a punching bag uh, for awfulness. Um so for me, as a wrestling fan, that happens to me a lot, actually. If I mention to people like, oh, I'm going to go watch the wrestling, immediately the reaction sometimes is, oh, that's terrible. And I, I, I'm i sorry. It, yeah. <laughs> In the, well, no, I mean, you know I'm better. In the past, I would have got really defensive. But as time's gone on, I'm just like, it, it doesn't bother me anymore. You know, yeah. this company is making millions of pounds, uh, millions of dollars. They're going around the world. They're supporting all these different people. I mean, Jesus Christ, John Cena has broken the world record of the most Make-A-Wish in the world. So, you know, if you want to bash on wrestling and say that it's shit, that's fine. But you're bashing mm -hmm. on those kids who want to see these things because it makes them feel better. So, <laughs> peace yeah. out. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we answered your questions best we can. Cheers, David. And uh, next question is from Rich Morton. What up, Rich? Yo, Rich. You mentioned in House of Wax. Oh, freaking hell, House of Wax. Yeah, I know. It's, it was a popular review we did. Uh, you mentioned in the House of Wax that it came at a time when many properties were being remade. 
It's been 19 years since then. How successful do you think this has been? And do you think there's more to its relative failure than, let's say, current issues or problems? So I'm, I kind of struggle with the question a little bit, like, because it's kind of hard to analyze the House of Wax success. So, I mean, it opened in 3,000... 111 theaters the film right. grossed 12 million in its opening weekend <clears throat> and then house of wax earned 70 million worldwide on a 32 million dollar budget yeah so um it it definitely earned its money back so it was successful financially mm. um now also i would say it, it may have done better at the cinema at the time so I looked at, I was just like, why maybe didn't it do as well as it could have done? And in the cinema at the same time as House of the Wax, uh, we had Crash, uh, The which, Sandlot which one, 2. Which one, the Cronenberg one yeah, or the other one? Yeah. Right. Uh, Sandlot 2, Kingdom of Heaven, Kicking and Screaming, and then the big one. Uh, Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, uh, then Madagascar, and then the following month saw the release of Batman Begins and war of the Worlds. oh wow yeah so yeah like there was a lot going on in the cinema when house of the wax was out um and so there were some big hitters there and now i think house of the wax was promoted fairly well because of the come and watch paris hilton get killed campaign that ran along with it mm. uh, but then again going against the film again 2005 remakes included assault on precinct 13 ring to the amityville horror and the house of wax so like we've already had some not so quality remakes. I, I don't. I also don't think many people realize House of the Wax was even a remake. Um, yeah. So, it's, but it's just, it's just another teen horror movie that had Paris Hilton in it. So, it was it was going to do. I think as well as it did. The fact that yeah. it has become a little bit of a cult movie now. I think it kind of earned it. I think I, it's earned it. But well, I, I mean, in a way, every film has a potential to become a cult film over time. Yeah. That's because people keep revisiting yeah, it, talking if about it. new audiences get into it and it gets a resurgence, you know, we've yeah. seen that with Evil Dead, we've seen it with Chucky, you know. House of Wax was the lowest of the low at 2005 when they were when they were dishing out these horror movies and they had been doing it. I mean, I don't want to say they'd been doing it all the whole time, but they had been doing it from like 1999 after like the success of Scream, mm -hmm. you know, and I know what you did last summer. Once we had those horror movies come out of the way, Urban Legend and all the others, that's when we got this new wave of remakes and they remade as many of the best ones as they could first. Mm -hmm. And those ones didn't do very well. Right. 13 Ghosts, House on Haunted Hill, The Haunting, things like that. They were trying to get, they were trying to scare us again. But it wasn't working. It was then. scaring us for different reasons. It was scaring us for different <laughs> reasons. Yeah, we, we were, as an audience, we wanted something new and fresh. We didn't mm. want remakes of rehashes of films that we already knew. Look at the, look at Psycho with, yeah. with fucking Vince Vaughn. That was a prime example Bates of... Bates Motel, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, no, it was just called Psycho. Okay, and I they, can't even remember. They, they, they remade it shot for shot and they, they, they showed it, for, you know, they did everything up to date and it's still slated as being one of the worst movies ever made. Yeah. No. Because it was... House of Waxes. <laughs> <laughs> but look at how... House of Wax. They're like, oh, we're going to make a horror movie and we're going to kill some teens and we're legitim legitimately going to put them in a house of wax. Yep. I'm telling you, even <laughs> at 2005, if I'd read that in a magazine, I'd be like, nah, I'm, I don't want to watch it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. I didn't want to. I, I don't understand what the urge was other than people wanting to go to the cinema to watch Paris Hilton die. So yeah. they should have just they shouldn't have called it House of Wax. They should have just called it Paris Hilton dies. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we yep. watched. We went to the cinema. What did you see? Paris Hilton dies. Was it good? You know uh, what? I got what I paid for. <laughs> yeah, her death was all right. You know? <laughs> Cheers for the question, Rich. Uh, next question is from Bran Zeno. What a Bran! Happy New Year, guys. If you could own and pilot any spaceship. Which would you choose? Oh, nice. I personally would choose the TARDIS from Doctor Who. Fist bumps all round. Nice. Cheers, Bran. Uh, my my go-to answers, uh, the Normandy from, from Mass Effect. Okay. Uh, Serenity nice. from Firefly. Uh, the Enterprise D. Mm -hmm. um, or just, you know, if I just want to get to the corner shop and back or the corner planet and back, mm. I'll just take Rick's spaceship from uh, Rick and Morty. I mean, that thing does everything, right? It's got everything you ever got want. It, pretty much. I mean, you won't know how it all works. <clears throat> no, but you just Rick. tell the computer what you want and oh. it usually makes it happen. Uh, I would take a Klingon bird of prey. 
Oh, nice, nice. I've always loved the look of that. I mean, it's got a cloaking device. It's like, if, it's like, is it just you? Then, you know, because like, I was like, if if I wanted to like the red dwarf, I'm like, it's too much. Yeah, that's too for much me. space. Well, the, the <laughs> funny thing is, uh, a Klingon bird of prey only crews 12. Yeah. Uh, the crew quarters are really quite small, actually. I mean, there's a bit of issue with the nuclear reactor or the dilithium crystal chamber, unless you can get it reinforced. Oh. Um, but like I said, most of it can be automated. You can run the whole thing on a crew of like four. Mm hmm. You know? Yeah, that's what I was like. Enterprise Cloak D, I was like, I want holograph, holograph, you know, the holodeck. The holodeck, I want, yeah. <clears throat> I want, you know, food, whatever, you know, it's just like yeah, all the luxuries. Replicators. It's basically all a luxury ship. Yeah. But I was like, but there's so much empty corridors and spaces. That would, that would, yeah, it'd be like walking around the shining version <laughs> of Star <laughs> Trek. Right? You know? It's horrifying. Come and play with us, Gary. <laughs> no! <laughs> uh. uh. But yeah, they're, they're, I mean, that, that's why I, I didn't like choose, you know, the Galactica, Battlestar Galactica. So it's just too big. Millennium Falcon, yeah. I'd rather go with the Enterprise D. Yeah. <laughs> well, Millennium Falcon's a good shot, actually. They're yeah. quite small. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Stephen Sloan. What up, Stephen? I never miss a show, guys. You're awesome. Hey, thank you, Stephen. Thanks. One of my favorite films is Wrestling Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> Wrestling. <laughs> starring Robert Duvall, Richard Harris, and Shirley MacLaine. Have you seen it? What do you think of it? I have not personally seen it. I may wiki it when I go home and watch Elimination Chamber, and then I'll let you know on the next podcast what I thought of the wiki. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, sadly, I've also never seen this film. Stephen Slow and I, I do apologise. Uh, sounds. Uh, I, I like the cast. Yeah. Interesting film title. Um, so I think you may have just put this one on my radar. Robert Duvall is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we uh, can't give you much more than that, Stephen. <laughs> we'll get back to your next podcast. Right, yeah. <laughs> Next question is from Havard Ryan. What up, Havard? Yo, dude. With AI script writing on the rise, do you think you, they will ever make a horror movie as great as the ones from the 1980s? Uh... <clears throat> now, I'm not sure if AI will make horror films better or worse. Well, some good horror films out the last few years mean much better, I feel, like the 2000s, 2010s. Mm -hmm. Um... But I, I mean, with the technology, with AI, it's unprecedented what it's already doing in terms of video creation as well as script creation. It's only going to be a, I mean, I've heard it said before, but AI at the moment is the worst today that it will ever, ever be. <laughs> yeah. it, it will not ever get worse. It will only get better. And it's already doing that. They say that, <clears throat> but this is humans we're talking about. Yeah. This is humans that we're working with trying to make AI work. And humans can barely get their day-to-day -to -day shit together, let alone a fucking working AI that can... Like, I, I, I don't know, understand what everyone's fear is, because all the AI stuff that I seem to see mm -hmm. online looks so hollow and fake. If you can't tell it's made by AI, then you really need your yeah, fucking head scene. The lines are blurring more and more and more. They might do. But they are. People but are this... getting fooled when there's... People have always Because there's voice fooled. generating stuff now as but well yeah, as visual. Well, yeah, yeah, people have always been fooled, but the voice generation stuff is still hollow because it hasn't got the emotion behind it as a real person talk. How much have you heard that's out there at the moment? Because I don't think you've exposed yourself I, to no, it I, as yeah, much. Well, maybe I have It's maybe I haven't, frightening. Maybe I haven't exposed myself, and maybe I haven't heard the best ones out there. But what I'm saying at the same time is even the best ones out there mm. are still just machines. They are, If yeah. they are the best ones out there, then maybe those are the best ones that you can be fooled with, and maybe those are the AIs that you want to be writing your script, scripts and if that's the case, then those scripts are going to be amazing yeah. because but they're going to be better than fake. We're only they're a few going to be years, the best. five, ten years away from AI is just going, input what you want, and then five minutes later, they will just churn out a movie. Right. Just like effects, but, actors, dialogue, sound effects, music, and just be but, churned out. But that's, what, like on, but that's what we've always wanted, isn't it? That's what hum and and I'm going back. That's what humans have been doing all the time, right? They make a horror movie and then you get. 10 people who tried to replicate that horror movie, but they don't do very well. And then, you know, on the success of that horror movie, depends on yeah. if you make it. The knockoffs will be out the day and after this, now. That, and the <laughs> next thing, and blah, blah, blah. Until 10, 20 years later, somebody's remaking that horror movie. Yeah. And so then I sit there and I go, okay, 
let AI do it because either you're going to have somebody really, really good behind the wheel mm. because the AI can't do anything on its own. Not it has yet. to. Not it, yet. It, well, it has to be. <laughs> they need some input. It yeah. has to be turned on. It has to be given the input. It has to be doing doing this, that, and everything like a standard computer, like oh, yeah. some, what somebody does when they write a script. <laughs> The thing is, is that when you get to the point where somebody gives them all the really good ideas, then the AI hasn't done that. Mm. It has get on the ideas from that one person. Yeah. It's what the AI does to develop that. And and the AI could spend a thousand times, a, a, a thousand practices trying to get it the best way you want it. Mm -hmm. You're the one who's going to be manipulating it going, ah, I've been reading this chat AI, uh, chat GP AI script, and I don't like that bit so we're going to change that bit when the moment you start changing it it's not the ai's anymore it's now yours you've changed it yeah so what you see like i said the the, the lines are blurring yeah but it's still going to be humans behind it <clears throat> and will For they now. will they get any better than the 80s yes because and no the, <laughs> well yes and no yeah. it's about the universe is a paradox <clears throat> i've always said this the horror movies of the 60s were good and bad. The horror movies of the 70s were better and worse. The horror movies of the 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010s, 2020s, 2050s, 2070s, year fucking, what's that song in the year 65, 65? <laughs> when those horror movies come out, we'll go, ah, not as good as the original. <laughs> Written by that AI. The toaster, the dancing toaster who wrote that horror movie about the killer toaster was the best horror movie. Totally better than Terrifier, the toaster movie. <laughs> Sorry, I went off on a bit one there. What was yeah. the question? <laughs> Do you think AI are going to make better movies than humans? Yeah, they can't be any worse than fucking Dark Fate. <laughs> well, there you have it. Have a, don't have to worry about the AI. Oh. <laughs> worry about the IA. <laughs> Next question is from Josh Del Monte. What up, Josh? This may be quite a complicated question. But they normally are, Josh. But <clears> right. Go ahead. Since it involves Hollywood, okay. how, since maybe its inception, yeah. it's functioned a certain way. Right. For example, okay. <clears throat> working like a factory by producing good and bad stuff. So 50-50 right. method or yeah. the other bit that the product turns out okay. Okay. Question. Yeah. Uh, this is not just a question about Hollywood. It could be about other forms of the entertainment industry. Right. Okay. So, cause, I mean, that's a broad spectrum. Uh, yeah. I, <clears throat> I mean... It's stuck to formulas. Let's put it into... Oh, my word. I'm sorry. I do apologize. <laughs> You're trying to read I'm this trying as to well. read it. I'm yeah. trying to read it. Uh, I mean, it's stuck to formulas. Let's put it into terms, for example. For the last decade, it's been more formulaic. So because so putting aside the money, but why has it stuck to a particular formula since the last 10 years? Though it always may have stuck to a formula, but maybe it took more risks during the last three decades? How also there is not a lot of risks taken through the mainstream bit nowadays. Okay, okay, right. Before we carry on, I totally kind of understand what you're meaning. But at the same time, I think you're walking right through the middle there, uh, Josh, by um, asking us how Hollywood has functioned <laughs> this way for a certain time, but also answering your own question by understanding that that's how Hollywood functions. Money. It's a business. It's a business. It, it, it will just keep taking in money and churning out follow trends and and following trends and making new trends and ending trends and creating trends that don't start off and then they will drop and they will move on uh what i what i have noticed particularly with hollywood but i've also noticed it with other in the entertainment industries around the world like um india's cinema and the european cinema even australian cinema and things like that is that um they are all trying to create entertainment for the masses, but the masses don't really know what they want to be entertained by on a day-to-day -day basis. One moment don't you like no, because one moment you like one thing, but then the next moment you've had too much of that one thing and you don't like it anymore, and so you want something new. But you like don't want superhero fatigue. But yeah, but you don't want anything new because you kind of want to go back to what you already know and you <clears throat> know you enjoy. I think it's. I think I heard it the other day. It's not. It's not superhero fatigue. I have. Right. It's bad movie fatigue. Is it, what I have. It is because I still want to watch superhero stuff. I'm excited for the new, new Umbrella Academy. Exactly, but people <clears throat> don't know what is bad until they actually watch it. But then some people don't know what is bad because they just look at something and they go, "No, I'm not watching it." So that can also cause something to be a failure. Because nobody, we always say, don't judge a book by its cover. But the first thing you do with a book is you look at the back and you go, 
ah, I might or might not read that. Hollywood just, Hollywood is just the bookmaker. They will hire writers. Very expensive books. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they will hire writers. The writers will write something. People will act it out and then they will put it out. Luckily, or luckily or unluckily, I don't know, but the creation of the internet gave us an insight behind the curtain more than they had in the 50s or the 60s. The only way you could see behind that curtain was by being there. And if you were being there, you were part of that product. Yeah. Yeah. You you can't you can't fuck around with any of the entertainment industry in your own way because you'll be blacklisted. You have to walk their fine line if you want to be, you know, finger quotes, successful. But you are only successful for as long as the people and they want you to be successful. If they keep don't... making stuff that your audience that you're making it for wants to see, you'll be fine. And if you don't, they <clears throat> will fucking burn you on the next call. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, right now we've just seen it that uh, musical biopics are in right They're now. In. So They're in. We'll probably uh, find out even more of these that are going ahead pretty soon. Yeah, one moment it's war <clears> movies, <throat> one moment it's musical biopics, one minute it's superhero movies. It's just been superhero most... movies for like 20 years nearly, so yeah. Well, it's well just... that's because Disney created their own. Yeah. They didn't have to wait for Hollywood to tell them to do it, Disney just Yeah, but that's why every other studio was like, well, we can make superhero movies too. Who do we own? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, we, we sold them all. Um, um, hopefully we answered your question there josh yeah, well, but josh is coming right back with yet oh, another question for hey, us josh, yeah <laughs> i'm noticing a pattern with recent female-led films or okay one with ensembles recently yeah madam webb has had a bad rep yeah this happened with the marvels and ghostbusters yeah. the reboot yeah with the women characters yeah i guess barbie was one and she hulk which i did not see the show i avoid superhero shows okay, okay. right and now i'm wondering if it's too easy to hate on something just because it has women or people with different colors or sexuality yeah maybe the superhero genre is dying i've not seen madam web but i also think i will avoid it since i'm bored with the superhero genre. you just said you don't watch them anyway yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but well, tv shows not, oh, not tv films. show okay uh, but I'm sure the story has a part to play in its failure. There's also been a pattern with Sony Marvel films where I think they have been underwhelming. Yeah. The Marvels I thought was a bad again due to story. Barbie I thought was okay. It was well made. Ghostbusters, the one the women I found watchable. And She-Hulk. Um, and She-Hulk of its critical reception. Uh, yeah. Um, female, female movies are easy to hate on, um, particularly because some men obviously are, you know, scared of women or sometimes get upset by it, that they think that too many women are getting too many leads in something it's not something present nowadays it's been around since creation of entertainment i mean if you look back at the 40s and the 50s with how films were made um female leads were kind of hard to come by you know you had to be you had to be a female star so successful to be given a lead the majority of them were mostly played by males. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always the damsel in, dis in distress, correct? With what I've noticed with a lot of female-led movies being failures, funny quotes again, um, is that they're just bad movies. They're badly written. They're That's not, it. I, 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 they're not <clears throat> badly acted. The, the, yeah. Look at look at Madam Web. A lot of people have been giving shit to the female the female lead. I, I can't remember her name is. I think she was the lady from Fifty is Shades it Dakota of Grey. Something? Dakota or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she didn't write it. No, she didn't finance the film. She didn't produce it. She didn't go up to Sony and go, "I've got an idea." She was just hired to play this part. She couldn't fight the the script writers and tell them she wasn't going to say certain things because otherwise she would have just had to have walked off set. Which yeah. meant the film wouldn't have had a lead and the film would have failed and it would have been a, a failure for everybody else who's taken part in it, which is a business. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the most recent, was it a couple of years ago now? Charlie's Angels, that did very Charlie's bad. Angels. But I mean, it, it's because it was a forced agenda, really. No, you know, the, no. the movies were getting political. You know, they, they, they wanted to say something without having much to say. And the... They're, they they hurt their characters and they hurt their stories by trying to force this in. Well, and it's the fact that the Hollywood industry system, especially with the big corporation ones, yeah. is that they now have all of these boxes that must be ticked in order to make your movie. They don't hire based on who's the best person for that job. That's true. They yeah, hire yeah, going, yeah. we must have so many 
X, so many Y and so many A's and B's I mean, they, to make this. They don't. And, but, and, and they're wondering why their movies are failing because they're not hiring the talented people. Yeah. They're hiring the people that they want to be able to go, it's such and such first time directing. It's such and such yeah, first yeah, time yeah, making yeah, 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 yeah. It's not because they were the best ones for it. It's because it's, they can say that about the movie and they hope that therefore it will be good. And it's not working, clearly. Um, it, and so it's uh, it's a bit of a mess. So I don't think it's got anything to do with a full female cast or no, anything like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, f- you know, full female ensemble movies can work and still I, will work. I can give When you... they are marketed towards the audience that they're being made for. Yeah. Now, especially got to come back to superhero movies because it seems to be the one, like the, the biggest one, obviously, like, in terms of money being spent and yeah, yeah. box office catastrophes. Um, I've, I've actually lost my train of thought. Well, I was, I, I was going to go me with you. And, yeah, you, 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 you go. I, so I can give you two examples of two female-led movies that were pretty much su- really quite successful um, in the time that I've been watching films. But a lot of people still don't talk about, even though that people like to talk about that they watch movies. Mm-hmm. Color Purple. You're right. Little Women. Right. Now you, you now you laugh, but yeah. those two movies are a female led. Yeah. Yeah. And the stories that they're telling are really hard hitting, but not a lot of people will go and watch. I mean, they've just remade the color purple. Yeah. yeah. Which I, which I really think is interesting, but it's not getting the advertising. I think that a movie like that should actually get, because as you said, people are a little bit tired that they're trying to tick all these boxes. Yeah. And it's not the filmmakers, the director or, or the stars that are trying to tick all these boxes. I mean, boxes. most of them don't even care about their source material. They just it's, it's the studios, because the studios, as we've already said with the Hollywood question, are trying to make money. Sony are desperate to make enough money to keep hold of the contracts that they have so that they can sit there and go, hey, we've got these contracts. No, you don't. You're barely holding on to them because you're barely making money from them because you can't make films. You think you can, so you throw a bunch of people into a room, you give them some some money and expect them to write a script, and then you expect that script that looks good on paper to then be transferred onto screen. Mm-hmm. It really doesn't work. I'll give you another female-led movie that I think was really quite successful. Death Proof. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I don't know how successful it was. I mean, it was it's Tarantino, so it's... It's, it's pretty pretty successful that it's part of his resume. Yeah, yeah. It's a, he, he says, that's my movie. I made it. He pays homage back to a load of other films. He got in uh, you know, a bunch of great actresses to play these parts. And yet, I don't remember one person sitting there going, I'm not going to watch that film because it's a fe- full female cast. Mm-hmm. I remember a lot of people going, man, I watched that movie. It was fucking great. Why? <laughs> because it was well written it was well directed it was well acted it had some good focal points like we said going back to madam webb a lot of people are, are blasting on madam webb for for the bad sequences that they've got in the movie yes that's because somebody wrote it and went we can't have spider-man right mm-hmm. nope you can't have this nope you can't have that nope well how the fuck am i supposed to construct a story around this you're gonna have to make shit up so they make shit up and hope that the audience, because this happens a lot, yeah. they hope that the audience will just switch their brain off and put it on in the background and then go, yeah, it was all right. Yeah. yeah. But more and more people aren't because they're getting fatigue. Something's coming out and they go, I'll watch it. That was bad. Now I've got to tell everybody why. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully we, we answered your question there. <laughs> Sorry, I lost my uh, trail of thought there. I was, getting, I was getting in rant mode. I was like, calm down, calm down. Um, but yeah, the state of Hollywood, it's, uh, it's fascinating. It's always, it's, it's always been bad and toxic. Mm. It's always been bad and toxic. Well, our next question is from Jay Cook. What up, Jay? Who wins the Rumble, Cody or Punk? Well, it weren't Punk, that's for sure. No. I wanted it, uh, obviously, because this is past, uh, and we already know Cody won it. He's going to WrestleMania. I was hoping for the double finish. I was oh, hoping, well, both out the same time. I was hoping Cody and Punk were going out at the same time. I was hoping then it would build up a little bit for them. Um, but Punk was injured halfway through the match. Um, and I think they had to call an audible. Mm. And Cody uh, won it. And that's why I think at the moment there's a whole lot of different stuff going on because they've had to change a few things. They've had to yeah. move a few matches around. People are getting injured, healed, things like that. I see your answer there. Uh, it's Triple H. Triple H. <laughs> Triple H comes out and wins it all. That's what he wanted it to be. 
Next question is from David Morris. What up, David? Yo, David. Great podcast as always, fellas. Thank you, David. Yes. Uh, my question is, you have to get rid of one major horror franchise from Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, Hellraiser, Saw. Which one gets the boot and why? I mean, uh, uh, they, they, they all have some great films and some absolute clangers. Cheers, fellas. Uh, I would get rid of Hellraiser. You'd get rid of Hellraiser? I'd get rid of Hellraiser because oh. out of the choice, Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, and Saw, all, all, all three of them have more successful, better movies than Hellraiser. For me, Hellraiser, one, two, three, and four possibly at a push <laughs> Are all right. I, I don't mind Inferno still yeah, as I, well. I knew you were going to say it, so that's why I had to get in first. <laughs> the Saw franchise, I, I, I've always said it, I feel it's consistent. It's starting to drag a little bit now, but they should have ended it at eight, <laughs> seven, eight, but they're still trying to do it out. Uh, Friday 13th, always always fun. You can't can't beat Jason. Yeah, Jason's yeah. badass. Now I'm on the street, who's going who's gonna to tell Robert Englund to go away? <laughs> right. You can't delete you those. You can't. That's the same with Tobin Bell. Like You can't get rid of Tobin Bell. Hellraiser, I, I love Doug Bradley, um, but how how I can live. See, I'm trying Hellraiser to think too. of like lesser horror franchise, and he's like, no, 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 major horror franchise. Major, yeah, yeah. So, um, oh yeah, which one are you getting rid of? You're gonna say it as well, aren't you? Don't 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 stab me. Halloween. Halloween's not on there. Yeah, well, no, it, it's a major one. It's, it's you have just... to get rid of one major horror franchise from Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, Hellraiser, and Saw. Oh, if I'm getting rid of Saw, easy. Oh. Yeah, goodbye, Saw. <laughs> you ain't touching my Hellraiser or my Nightmare on Elm Street or but Freddy you... and Jason, you ain't touching. Fucking... You ain't touching. And Pinhead, he's just, he's just awesome. Yeah, he's a glutton Pin... for punishment. I put Pinhead and Jigsaw in the, in the room together. and <laughs> Bro, Pin... Oh, my God! The devastating, horrendous flesh traps jigsaw and pinhead could devise together oh, would it would be, be disgusting but it, <laughs> the, the, yeah because they don't kill you they keep you alive John kramer and in opens the, the lament configuration oh, God. <laughs> yeah. and he's just like pinhead steps out and the trap goes off yeah <laughs> pinhead you have captured so many souls but now can you save your own you i want to play game. a game <laughs> The, the traps ki- the traps don't kill you they keep you alive and you kind of actually really enjoy it a little bit yeah oh it's the spin off we didn't know we needed oh, cheers for the question David <laughs> next question is from Dean Bennett what up Dean yo Dean what do you think about the new fantastic forecasting will it hit or miss I'm I'm pretty happy with the casting Pedro Pascal uh, Vanessa Kirby which are kind of I think she's pretty damn amazing, actually. Uh, Joseph Quinn, he was Eddie Munson in Stranger Things. Uh, and uh, Eben Moss uh, Backrack, uh, who's in The Bear as well, the TV show. Uh, I, who's Vanessa Kirby? Um, she played um, opposite um, uh, Phoenix in Napoleon, played his, love, his wife. Uh, she was in The Crown. All right. Okay. Um, um, she was in. Uh, I think she was in one of the last Mission Impossible films. I I'm having problems with the Fantastic Four movies. Actually, I mean, it's not. Su- I know it's not superhero fatigue, um, because I I'm a sucker for superhero movies. Cut but them. The 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 issue I've got is, I mean, so basically, Mister Fantastic is going to be Spanish. Yeah, because Pedro, yeah. Pedro Pascal. Yeah. Is. So, Mr. Fan, and so then I've got to believe that him and Vanessa Kirby are in love because Sue Richards and Reed yeah. Richards <clears throat> have to be in love. Yeah, yeah. If they try to do what they did with the last Fantastic Four, did you see the last one? Yeah, I did, yeah. That was fucking shockingly bad. That is a bad fucking movie. Anybody <laughs> sitting there going, oh, Madame Webb's a fucking bad movie, watch that last Fantastic fucking Four movie and come and tell me that you know what a fucking bad movie is. Because somebody sat there and went, oh, I know, let's take Doctor Doom and send him to an alien planet for most of the bloody movie and then bring him back at the end. Oh, look at this guy. He's turned into rock. Wasn't it fucking Michael B. Jordan? Wasn't, yeah, Michael yeah. B. Jordan was the half-brother of Sue Storm. I was like... Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. What, what are you doing? Oh, well, we're trying... And, and exactly what you said. They're tr- they're, we're trying something new. So we're trying to tick all the right boxes of so that we can get this film out so it covers all the audience. Any of the people in the audience know who the Fantastic Four is and they know Michael B. Jordan is not Johnny Storm. <laughs> 
It could have been. So I, I so I'm, I, I like Pedro Pascal, and I'm sure the rest of them are really well. Yeah, but, I think it's a solid cast. I'm, but, I'm really, really happy with this casting. But it's, uh, it's, so yeah. I just now hope, as we mentioned earlier, that the writing is good. Yeah, like, it doesn't have to be excellent. Just be good, because these actors will carry it. It doesn't have to be fantastic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> God, <laughs> uh, yeah, it should have been the guy from Multiverse of Madness. He he was Reed Richards. Yeah, it should yeah. have been him. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, well, we have our next question uh, from the Unliving Weevil. What up, Unliving Weevil? Hey lads, so glad got in the stream. My question is: Have any of you seen Alpha Dog? Oh, uh, it stars Justin Timberlake and Bruce Willis. It's based on a true crime story about a drug deal and kidnapping. Definitely one of my favorite films. Have you seen it? No, I haven't seen it. I- I've seen it. It's I'm... got um, Anton Yelton in it as well. Oh, one of nice. his earliest nice. roles. What year is it? Um, uh, got a, early two thousands. Yeah, or so. yeah uh, I, I have to say the my, my my overwhelming sense of memory of the film is that it's very loud. Like there's lots of yelling and screaming, and then there's shooting and and, and more yelling. Okay. Uh, but yeah, what what surprised me is that it's a true story. I, and when the film ends and you're like, wow, all of that happened. And the film keeps reminding you, it keeps going, here's witness one, witness two, witness 47, witness 62. Oh, okay. It's just like how openly stupid the events were. There were so many witnesses. It's no wonder that things you know went down and uh, yeah. people went to jail after this. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, I, I, I just, it's one of those films where I'm like, Anthony Elton, I miss that actor. He was so good. So good. Uh, but yeah, if uh, if you do get a chance to see it, I mean, it's loud. It's uh, uh, lots of lots of swearing, but some yeah. great great performance. I mean, Bruce Willis is in it. He's in it for like thirty seconds. Uh, yeah. and he plays the dad of one of the kids who turns up, going, "What happened? I can't believe that happened." Oh, okay. That's it, that's it really. Sorry, I was just noticing that. Is that cool? The yeah. uh, the, the, the circle. There. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't, don't worry, don't worry. No, I'm not worried about that. No, I'm not worried about that. Yeah. I mean, I like I still need to see it in time because I think. Um, Justin Timberlake is supposed to be really good in that. Yeah. And there was a, a another film where he was playing like the brother, or the, the older brother to a family. And I think he was really trying to act in that one. Yeah. But um, no. No, he, he was actually a pretty good actor. I actually forgot that it was him yeah. uh, during the film. So, yeah. Uh, definitely worth a watch. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next question is... I'm sorry. <laughs> From Craig's house. <laughs> what up, Craig? <laughs> What game would you like uh, to be made into a film and what film would you like to see be made into a game? You can only choose that haven't been made yet. Um, Obviously, I would like um, a Duke Nukem movie. That would be great. Um, nice. I would like, I'd like a Manhunt movie. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. the guy has to go around and he has to murder people to try and get past his family and stuff like that. Um, I've seen that they just dropped the Borderlands trailer. I'm so fucking not watching that. Um, trailer. I've heard some. I've heard some interesting things about the Borderlands. One of the, one of the first comments I saw on that trailer was, "Why is everyone so fucking old?" <laughs> so, well, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a fairly, I guess, you know, older cast. Chris, but Chris, they're trying just, to get the older. Audience. I just, I was just so done with Borderlands, though. I just, yeah, I just I didn't I, really I, care. Like, I love post apocalypticness, but when it's so. Borderlands, I yeah. just don't care. Yeah, that's uh, that's exactly every time I say the game, that's exactly how I feel. Borderland, <laughs> you know, like the that, I don't know, claptrap just annoys that no, annoys the piss out of me. Even if it's Jack Black doing it now, I'm like, ah. but that's the point. The first game dropped, and it was just like, oh yeah, you're gonna have like a bajillion guns, <laughs> and I'm like, all right, why would you? You can only fire like two or three at a time, and then it turns out that actually it's the same guns. They just get upgraded a little bit more with. Well, there's there's lots of different you know. particle effects and effects and yeah. right. So there's not yeah right. That's it. There's not a million guns. There's pretty much the same. There's like ten guns, but they all just got different effects that build up yeah. as you level up. Then you drop Borderlands Two. What was the big draw of Borderlands Two? More of the same. More but cabajillion more. guns. Yeah. Right. Okay. Borderlands <laughs> Three, and I was just like, no, nah, I'm good. So now they drop this film. 
In fairness, though, if the film's a shit, I'm, I'm willing the game, to. I'm, I'm willing to give the film a go. Of course you are. You watched a fucking film where a plane crashed and fucking and de- sharks got on the plane. Sharks on the plane. Yeah. <laughs> I know what I like, <laughs> and I stuck with it. <laughs> Uh, cheers for the question, Thanks, Greg. Greg. <laughs> Next question is from Waffles Hannibal. What up, Waffles <clears throat> Hannibal? Favorite Carl Weathers performance? Great, great question, Waffles. Um, I would go with um, it's you know, I, all, I all go in with the hips. <laughs> it's all in. The... No, that's not my answer. It's it's Apollo Creed, without uh, a doubt. Yeah, it's got to be Apollo. I want to. But which almost, one? Which I, movie? Ah. Uh, I, I I'm gonna go Rocky Four. Really? I'm gonna go Rocky Four. I like. I like. I remember Rocky Four being kind of one of the first ones I watched before I actually went back and replayed the whole series. Yeah. And when he comes down and he's looking at Dolph Lundgren, if he's looking at Ivan Drago, he he, he is scared because he's an old older man, you know, and he doesn't think he can take him, but he still gets in the room at the ring. He still does all that showboating. And when he dies, you mm. tell me yeah, somebody somebody who didn't feel that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's because there's no easy way out plays afterwards. Fucking and love it. It's a great song, great montage. And yeah. But if you'd been following the scene, like, and like I said, fr- I had it's, it's the friendship that I they have that in that the third one. Yeah. That it's what builds that moment, you know? Um, but yeah, it's tough. Like, uh, da, da, there's no easy way out. I, I I would say probably Rocky won. Um yeah, just be. because I uh, I think I think Carl Weathers in Rocky One is the better is the best actor in that film. And I think because he is so good and because he is he has all that ego and that bravado around him that you believe mm. in in Apollo Creed yeah. so much so that he it feels like it's an impossible challenge for Rocky, and that's I think down to Carl Weathers' performance. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I love the character, and I love his performance in the sequels as well. But I think he gives the best and most well-rounded performance in the first one. But my th- probably the third one would be my favorite, where was, the friendship yeah comes I was in. Gonna say that as well. Yeah, and th- th- that's the cool thing about Carl Weathers is that he went toe to toe with two of the biggest action icons. Of, of of our time, Sylvester Sloan and Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he elevated those Both performances. He, yeah. he made without without Apollo Creed, there is no Rocky. And I know only you know he he wasn't in he was just in Predator uh, as Dylan, but their relationship, him and Arnold Schwarzenegger, hitting hands at the beginning, you yeah. know the betrayal of being turned on your friend, that actually hurts more than knowing that there's a freaking creature out there <laughs> that can hunt them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. All right, cheers for the question, Waffle. Next question is from Old Restless. What up, Old Restless? Do you guys have any interest in painting miniatures or tabletop games? Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, I I happen to spend several hundred pounds a year on tabletop gaming. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't play, uh, I don't play Warhammer or Games no. Workshop. Sorry, no, Games don't. Workshop games. Yeah. Um. Although I I have played Necromunda and well, actually no, that's uh, a lie. Space you, Hulk, Space Crusade. I was gonna say you do play. Yeah, but I don't. Games. But I don't. You play, don't play the forty k as we know it. Yeah, now. and yeah. so I don't paint miniatures. I I I did as a kid. Yeah, uh, in my teens I did, but not not to a certain level because I saw the craftsmanship that was required, yeah, and yeah. I just like I spray paint it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I paint the eyes and a smile. It's like the Joker makeup on my. The gun is all silver. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, there's no detail at all. The bolter is like, <laughs> yeah, it's just paint globbed on there. Yeah, to get it it's ready. painted in it. <laughs> so yeah, for painting, no, but I love the craftsmanship that goes into it. But yeah, I. Uh, I, I, I buy board games and receive board games as gifts. It's one of my favorite pastimes is movies, TV, and board games, and yeah. video games. You know, it's uh, so yeah. My uh, uh, currently playing um, uh, Resident Evil One, the board game. Just finished a campaign of Oathsworn. Still currently playing Arkham Horror, the card game. Uh, playing through, uh, played through Gloomhaven. Uh, we're about halfway past the halfway mark on Frosthaven. Um, just so many games uh, that I'm jumping back and forth from, um, but yeah, I l- love me some some board games, card games, 
one of my favorite things you know is to sit around a table with friends and roll dice play cards and uh, and have a laugh and if there's role play elements to it even better as well yeah uh yeah i same as gary i used to paint when i was in my teens i am a space wolf fan of 40k sorry i'm gonna cough now oh yeah <laughs> <coughs> good old cough comes a lot it's all those cigars <coughs> you okay two seconds oh dear. yeah <laughs> get, you get that tickle i was listening to it's you i'm just, like i'm yeah. ready to go and then i got the tickle <laughs> um yeah so i was a, i'm a space wolf fan i did get a space wolf army i did put one together but then like gary I saw the craftsmanship that other people were painting and I was tr doing my best. I was trying my best, but the world of games workshop, they, they can be harsh. Mm. You know, people will judge you on the tiniest little things on your painting because they've been painting for so much longer. And so after a while I was like, you know what? I, I love space walls. I love the law. I'm, I'm happy to have an army, but I'm not happy to deploy it because it just became too competitive, too many tournaments, too many standards, all this kind of stuff. Uh, same as Gary, I went on a massive binge and I just bought shit tons of board games. But I bought film specific board games like I've got the Highlander board game. I've got Back to the Future board game, Star Trek Catan, you know, Resident Evil. I like. I love <laughs> just buying you movie related board well, games. Uh, I've, got, I've got two <laughs> versions of the Thing board game. I never ever thought that they ever released one. Like I wrote notes like years ago about how I would make a thing board game. And then years later they made two and I got both of them. Uh, like Gary, I recently bought Resident Evil one. I've looked at it. I've opened it, looked at it, looked at the models and I put it back. <laughs> goes on top of my Resident Evil two and Resident Evil three that I have that I still haven't played. Cause I just bought it for the models. Cause the models look sweet. And then, I mean, well, the best one we ever did was on Bocalypse. Yeah. Came you know, and broke down uh, the Doom board game, Doom Gears board of game, War board game, Gears and... of War, Zombies, the board game that they had with that. We created our own map tiles, created our own pieces, got our own dice, made our own rules, threw together our own campaign and all that kind of stuff, created our own characters. I mean, for, oh, what, how many fucking years did we play that for? Ten? ten I was going to say, it had to have been ten years, wasn't it? It was ten yeah. years that we... Every Saturday, we would get together and at least between... Basically Dungeons and Dragons, but a zombie, a modern day zombie apocalypse. Yeah, with film references in and our own ideas. From it. We went from three or four of us playing it up to about eight Seven. or nine. Yeah, sometimes we had to turn people away. We're like, we can't, we can't play it because each person's <laughs> turn would take so long that like three hours would pass and we barely got halfway through the story that Gary's trying to tell us. Mm -hmm. So then we had to minimize it down. And It's a shame, but yeah, it was, it was great. It was very popular. It yeah. Was... I, our friend Adrian, he, he helped um, uh, with a 3D, paint, uh, 3D printer. He created our models for the Zombies game. <laughs> yeah. He's going on a mad one at the moment yeah. because uh, he's into Star Wars and Star Wars Legion and he's painted all those models. He's a great painter. He's the reason why I don't fucking paint. <laughs> yeah, he's right. a fucking dick. <laughs> Sorry, Adrian. No, I'm joking. Um, but he were, he's just been 3D printing um, tanks and flyers from the Clone Wars nice. war stuff so that he can use it on the board. Very and good. Very I, good. I played one game with him. It was so good where it was troopers versus droids and halfway through the battle he had this flyer that i was just shooting from the start to kill it yeah and i did so much damage i had one health left and fucking um i i had darth maul on my side okay darth yeah. maul did a did a jedi jump onto a rock and then threw his double bladed oh, lightsaber. Oh, throw that at the thing. Threw yeah. that lightsaber right through the cockpit of that <laughs> fucking fighter and it crashed and burned. It was amazing. Nice. Got a nice. little tabletop. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Hopefully we answered your question there, Old Restless. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. And our final, final question final for the podcast question. is from Rio Quinn. What up, Rio Quinn? Um, watching The Zone of Interest. Oh, yeah. Have you seen that? No. I've wikied it. Okay. Yeah. A film that tells its real story through the background audio. Can you think of a film that affected you through an element that wasn't what was visually shown on screen? Yes. Um, irreversible. I, I, I'm trying to follow the question. What's the question? Well, the question is, The question is, was there an element in a film that affected you that you didn't actually hear or see? Because, okay. it was, because the film was focused on something else. And I get what he means. Yeah. So so basically, um, 
I'm not going to try not because yeah, I don't. I don't. I'm not going to spoil it for you. But um, Zone of Interest follows a German um, German concentration camp commander Mm -hmm. who is living with his family. Oh, I know the scene actually. I heard, and they can hear the concentration camps from their homes. Yeah, inside their little garden, everything's perfect, and they're all so happy. I heard how effective that that moment is. You can hear the screams and the burning and and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I said, irreversible. Yeah. Um, that sequence where the girl's walking down and she gets attacked by the guy and they actually go off screen. Yeah. But he pops up every now and again and you can still hear the hitting yeah. and the sexual rape stuff. Um, Jaws does the same thing, really. Little fucking, what's it, the Kiltner boy. Yeah. You don't see him really get eaten. But True. But you know something's not good. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> it's a great question, actually. I'm just trying to think now if there's anything else. Um, Seven, when he says, I took her pretty head, and you, you don't yeah. see her head in the box, but you after everything you've seen with Gwyneth Paltrow, you're like, oh, fuck. Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> um, you keep going here. You seem to have quite a few. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to think you know, of one. Uh, I think of one. Uh, something else that affected me in a movie that I didn't actually see. Dark Fate, when Sarah Connor talks about how she's been killing Terminators, been getting all this information from the Terminators, sent her through text messages, but you don't see shit. And you're supposed to just establish that. Oh, well, what about Ghostbusters Afterlife, where you're supposed to believe that there's this whole fucking family background about this woman who gave birth to this child that nobody's ever fucking seen, nobody ever names. <laughs> You got any more? <laughs> um, uh, oof, oh. I mean, what are other examples of that? That you know, because um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of any really. I, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to be affected by by stuff in film anyway. But I'm trying to think of specifically stuff that's off, you know, off camera or not not highlighted. Mm. Um, but I imagine that sequence in the zone of interest would be obviously pretty high up there. Oh, you know what's another good one? Go on. Scarface. When they're being hanged up in the little bathroom. Yeah. And he, he, he watches his mate get chainsawed, but you don't see it. True, yeah. You just yeah. hear the saw and then you hear the TV get turned up. Yeah. And then the guy's just like, now I'm going to do this to you, goblin. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I was thinking of like um, uh, Event Horizon. But we we get to see flashes of what's going on. We hear it mostly, mm. but we do get to see the flashes. But it didn't really, not really affected by it. No, well, I got kind of affected by the woman who's talking about her son. Yeah, and you you know that he's ill, but she's not there. And then he's just like, "Mommy," and makes her follow him. And he falls. Yeah. Um, it's the whole film, according to Rio Quinn. It's the whole film of Zone of Interest, not just a scene. Mm. It's a hard film to watch. I imagine yeah, so. Yeah, it's, it's a film following a concentration camp. How, how, how did you think that film was going to be? Like, it, I still haven't seen The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, okay. and I will. I barely. You don't can, want to. I, do you, I no. can't because I I just know how that ending goes. Mm-hmm. And as a as a parent, maybe it would just affect me differently. But even if I wasn't a parent, like well, obviously I wasn't a parent. Dylan was born and I still didn't want to watch the film Yeah, because I just knew that it built up to this ending that in my head I may have imagined it too much than what it's shown in the film Mm -hmm. but I don't need to see it Yeah, I don't particularly would like to see it I might watch it at some point and I'll have to (laughs) sit through it but I certainly don't think I'll ever go oh I'm glad I watched Boy in the Striped Pajamas I enjoyed that (laughs) same as Zone of Interest everyone's like man this film's like really really good I'm like I'm good I don't need to feel that yeah i i I, how is i'm not dissing it i'm not being negative to people who are watching it it's just like how how are you supposed to come out of a movie like that and go wow that was that was enjoyable i enjoyed that so and nick's got a good one here by saying uh from dusk till dawn the bank teller oh yeah sits in the hotel yes that's uh, tarantino yeah that's yeah what is wrong with you is there (laughs) something wrong with you yeah, that's a, that's a good one. But, I mean, that again was the subliminal, wasn't it? The quick flashing imagery. Um, I'm a professional fucking thief. I don't kill anybody. I don't have to, and I don't rape women. What you are doing, what you are doing is not how it's fucking done. <laughs> I love that sequence. Great sequence. Uh, Mahoy just also mentioned Martyrs. Uh, now, that's just a film yeah. I, I just don't want to watch ever again. So, I guess that one was pretty effective. But then again, 
You got to see the skin off. It's horrible. I don't want to see that again. <laughs> you, you're a, you'll watch a woman get hacksawed in half by a clown who isn't making any laughs, but you can't oh, go back and funny. watch mine. <laughs> that was funny. Martyrs is not funny. <laughs> I don't know. See, I, um, I like fantasy horror. I can watch people walk around with no skin on in Hellraiser, and I'm like, that's class. Yeah. When I see it in Martyrs, I'm like, that's disgusting. <laughs> You're it's gonna die! It's because it's well done, that's it. Yeah, it's well yeah, done. It's so, true. It's the, it's the French again, isn't it? It's the French and the spider stuff. Yeah. Oh, man. Well. Yeah. Well, on that note. Yeah, I think that's. I think, um, I'm Thank you for the question, Rio. Trying Quinn. not to think yeah. about too many dark no, things now. Exactly. What a way yeah. to end it. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, well, I hope you uh, enjoyed uh, this podcast. A very short one this time. It was a short month in February. Yeah. So, But we'll be back next month. And uh, you can find our film reviews on Thursdays on YouTube. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Patreon, and on Discord. Yes. Keep that conversation rolling. Come and join us on the Discord. And we'll see you next month on the next one. Next Cheers, podcast. everyone. Woo!